Oh, good morning. I don't feel super great this morning, but <sighs> that's okay. So, we can't get paid for our job yet because we can't get to our mission computer. It's in the boat. And we can't get in that boat until we go talk to Kindly Chen. I need that money. So, I guess we're going down here. Let me check my inventory real quick. Yeah, I need to upgrade, upgrade this stuff. Uh, Dr. Shenyang. What was your deal again? Uh, okay. Well, everyone's here. Wow, even our ghoul friend. As you walk through the Mahjong parlor, you see your crew waiting for you, clearly uncomfortable to be so close to the triad boss. Then you see why. Kindly Cheng's cheeks are flushed and glowing. She's already hit the bottle pretty hard. Ah, the plague. You're here. Excellent. Yes, the plague. It is good to see you. Um, yeah, you said you had a lead, Auntie. Let's do this. I did, and I do. The wiretap we placed on the police force has borne fruit. My people have delivered a snippet of a recorded video call between the plastic-faced man and Chief Inspector Crate of the Special Duties Unit. Whoa. This should be good. Should we, uh, take a seat? Unfortunately, it's only a snippet. There were some technical difficulties with the tap. The person responsible has been sacked. Cheng reaches out a lacquered fingernail, hunts for the button she is looking for, and stabs it in victory. There's a loud, crackling noise at the beginning of the recording, followed by a squelching squeal that makes Gobbit cover her ears in pain. When the video recording begins, the man's voice sounds far away, as if he's talking through a thick pane of glass. The woman's is louder, closer. Say that again. There's something wrong with this line. I said my client isn't interested in hearing more excuses, Inspector. That's what I thought you said. I'm not making excuses, mister. I have a department to run. Not for much longer. If those two Westerners aren't found, they're linked to this Raymond Black somehow, and my client wants them out of circulation immediately. Two runners are as accomplished as two. The little orc and the dwarf with the cyber deck. Hmm. I'm aware, Inspector. Thank you. We don't know how much any of them know, and my client is adamant that the risk be mitigated immediately. I've already made the SDU's... Uh, oh, I've already made this the SDU's highest priority. If Josephine wants more resources on it, I'm going to need allocations from elsewhere in the department. That is a problem that can be easily dealt with. My client wants this over now. No more excuses, no more fuck-ups, no more cops floating in the river. Huh. Tell her we're redoubling our efforts. Very good. Dead or alive, you bring them to me. My client requires my personal verification that the threat has been eliminated. Hang on. The line's getting worse. 
there's a sharp crackle and the recording ends. Kindly Cheng picks up her PDA and puts it away with a smile. She unscrews the cap on her bottle and pours herself a shot with a flourish. That's the guy we saw in the surveillance footage, the one who killed Raymond Black. That plastic face looks a lot cooler close up. Jeez. I think it's kind of pretty. What is with you two? Come on. This guy's evil. Video doesn't tell us much. I mean, we already know that there's an APB on us. And we're sure now, uh, all we're sure of now is the man with the plastic face is definitely working for someone else. This, uh, Josephine. Is that all we have, Auntie? A first name? It's not just a first name, Gobbit dear. It's the first name. Josephine Tsang. She's the one pulling the strings. That disease-riddled dog fucker. I should have known it was her from the beginning. And she had the nerve to call down the heat on my rudders? On Night Jar? Oh, that scabrous fossil's going to pay. Jeez. Yeah, so she's a powerful lady, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. She is the CEO of Sang Mechanical Services and a member of the Hong Kong Executive Council. Josephine Dog Fucking Sang. Um. Hmm. Sang Mechanical Services, what do they do? Ah, yes, Josephine's baby. It was a B-rated corporation before she married into the Tsang family. But after she fought for and won the contract to rebuild Kowloon Walled City, their fortunes rose high. They began to rise in power, uh, to power that eventually landed Josephine on the executive council. Yeah, she, wait, she built the fucking walled city? Yes, the same place Raymond Black hired my runners to take him. I've already connected the dots. I know what it means, but it cl I don't know what it means, but it clearly means something. And yeah, what's her next step? There's not much we can do to touch Josephine Tsang, as much as I hate to admit it. But the plastic-faced man's a different story. He's a third-party operative who's been careless, and he'll live to regret it. For a while. If Song thinks she can take out two of my runners and get away with it, I'm going to have to explain things to her. We're going to find the plastic faced man and we're going to hurt him. We'll hurt him until we know everything he does. And then we'll use that to strike back at Josephine. You'll have your vengeance and I'll have my own satisfaction. Now get out, I have work to do. Cool, I have work to do too. I don't want to be here. I want to be getting my money. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Demand payment. Nice. Wow, Andy is pleased with us. Okay, so I still have to attend this party. Um, I want to be a socialite for that, didn't I? I don't think we spent our charisma yet doing that. Or did we? How do I see what my, um... I 
how the fuck do I see what my etiquettes are? Oh, we have some pay data. That's for us. Oh, okay, there we go. Corporate security socialite. So we do already have the socialite. Nice. Uh, plus one AP would be lovely, but we don't have enough points. Still have those two jobs. Let's do the uh, the one job that we have right there though first. Cool. Oh yeah, and we yeah we have payment data. Oh, uh, from Gavi. Hey Seattle, I think I can add a little context to that thing between Auntie and Josephine. You know, the thing that makes Auntie hit the sauce and talk revenge. This is a combo of stuff I heard and stuff I put together myself, so your mileage may vary. For years, the Yellow Lotus acted as tax collectors within the Walled City. Since the Walled City was built by Josephine and the Yellow Lotus was run by Auntie Cheng, they must have had a working business relationship, for a while at least. From what Nightjar told me, he was her favorite. You got that right? Auntie was known as a real up-and-comer back then. She was on the fast track to be the next Yellow Lotus 438. That's a big deal gig, Seattle. Money and power galore. Now you need to know that there were a lot of triads and corpse doing biz in the walled city. All sorts of stuff. Sometimes they worked together nicely, and sometimes people get bloody. The way I heard it, Andy came up with some sort of grand plan to consolidate businesses in the walled city. The power would be split between the Yellow Lotus and Sang's company, and everyone else would get a, would get cut out. If her plan worked, Auntie would rise in the Lotus like nobody's business, and Josephine would make a long bank. There was a catch, though. In order for the plan to work, both women would need to jump through a lot of hoops. There'd be street-level maneuvering and power plays on Auntie's side, and blackmail and negotiations on the corporate level from Josephine. My info gets sketchy here, but from what I've pieced together, Sang went behind Auntie's back and took her plan to her boss, a 438 named Wong Lung Fat. They cut kindly out of her own plan. Why'd she do that? My guess is she saw Auntie as some sort of threat. People in the know say that Wang Lung Fat uh, is weak and greedy. She can be manipulated if her palm remains well greased. So long story short, power was consolidated in the walled city, just as planned. Only Auntie didn't wind up getting any of it. Her climb up the lotus ladder came to an abrupt halt. She's still a straw sandal, just like she was before Sang backstabbed her. And now she's stuck in Hioi like a fly in amber. I'd be pissed too if it were me. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, you got anything new to say, Reactor? Ah, uh, my friend, you've done an admirable, admirable job. An admirable job indeed. I've already incorporated the technology that you recovered. My stolen tech. Into a new chassis that I'm fabricating for Koshche. Um, glad to be of help. Hey, you will be, my friend. Very glad, very glad indeed. Next time we take to the field, you can expect to find Koshche's combat effectiveness considerably improved. He has become truly deathless, just as his namesake was in the legends. When he takes damage, he will mend himself before your eyes. Sweet. Uh, 
How you doing, Gatch? Um, see you later. Actually, no, let's ask him if he had any thoughts on the last run. A good run, I think. Unexpected complications, perhaps, but all told, we were quite successful. With any luck, the Red Dragon will be paid a visit by Knight Errant security, and soon. Despite the other team, we sowed enough chaos that I doubt that Ares will realize our deception. I think giving the other Shadowrunners the laser may have been the wisest course of action in the long run. The shadows do not forget favors like that, and help in a time of difficulty is often the difference between life and death. Besides, I doubt we needed another weapon. We are quite effective as is. I agree. Yeah, later, dude. Talk to Isabel. Hey, how, how's that octopus going? Isabel is jacked into the octopus. Her body sits inert, her breathing shallow. As you approach, an image blossoms onto the largest of octopuses' view screens. <coughs> oh, that's cool. Hello down there. It's good to see you again. Huh. Oh, nice avatar. It's pretty sweet. Isn't it? I've spent months customizing this avatar. She feels more real to me than my own skin. Oh, that's kind of sad in a way, but... But you do look happy. I... I suppose I am. It's a comfort thing. As long as I'm jacked in, I can be whoever I want to be. Whatever I want to be. Out there in meat space, I usually feel uncomfortable in my own skin. I'd probably just live in here if I could. <laughs> yeah, not probably a great idea. I know, I know. And of course I was joking. But truth be told, I do spend most of my time out there, wishing I were back in here. You're a Decker. You must know what I'm talking about. The freedom of it. It's hard to live in a cage of meat when you know how sweet it feels to leave your body behind. I'm not actually a Decker. I know a little bit about uh, hacking, but I've never used a deck, and I don't own a deck. So... She pauses for a moment, considering, then her avatar shimmers forward, filling the screen. A slight frown crosses her face. You know the plague. I've been thinking about the question you asked me a little while back. The one about the walled city. The, uh, the one that I dodged. Um... Yeah, I remember. Look... I wasn't trying to cheat you out of your answer. I want you to know that. It's just that talking about the walled city is... problematic for me. Yeah, um, hmm. I understand. No, it isn't that. I'm not explaining myself correctly. It isn't that I'm tortured by bad memories or anything like that. The problem is, I can't remember my childhood. The Walled City, that entire chapter of my life, is nothing but a blur to me. And I can give you general information about life on the inside, but the specifics of my own experience are gone. Gone? What do you mean? Something like that. There are a variety of factors in play. The upshot of all this is that there are things that I can tell you about, but only a few, and only in bold strokes. Don't expect any personal stories. I couldn't share them if I, even if I wanted to. So if that's okay with you, if you'll be satisfied with trivia and urban legends, 
Then we can talk. Just say the word. Otherwise, well, at least now you know why. Yeah, how do you lose your memories? <laughs> of course. I'd rather not go into it. It's personal. Suffice it to say, I've never missed them. At least it's not until now. <coughs> Fuck. Excuse me. If you ever want to talk about it, I'll listen. Great. I'll keep that in mind. Um, yeah, what do you know about the Lord Seder? Alright, I can do that. Isabel's avatar turns, begins to pace on the screen, where she steps spider webs of light spread across the tiled ground of the octopus's sculpted matrix hub. When I think about the walled city, the thing that stands out the most in my mind is the legends, the mythology of the place. If I hadn't lived with them, I might have found those stories fascinating. Did you know that Kowloon walled city is supposed to be cursed? That's what the locals believe. We had ghost stories and everything. Ghost stories? Yeah, our own homegrown legends about things that haunted the walled city. Demons from another place. The Yama Kings. Yeah, what can you tell me? <sighs> It'd probably be easiest, easiest to think of them like urban legends. Our own little pantheon of monsters and morality tales to frighten ourselves with at night. The stories are still clear in my mind, even after everything that happened. Everyone in the walled city believed them. You can get out of the walled city if you make a deal with Fu Mong. Cut the hearts from the 44 people closest to you and bring them to him. He will reward you with riches. Don't go under that arch, or Kyanya will catch you. She'll rip out your teeth, tie your tongue in a knot, and make you her slave for eternity. Um hmm. We had Chi Shang, our own homegrown judge of souls. People would let themselves be flayed alive in hopes that he'd reawaken them in a better life. And we had Lam V the Ebony Queen, who'd teach you to hide so well you'd slowly mutate into a cockroach. What sort of weird ass deities are these? It's all bullshit of course, but everybody in the walled city believed it. The Yama Kings. Yeah, why does everyone believe in them? Because they're an excuse. My parents and neighbors, their whole generation, invented things to explain away their own failings. I can't get ahead because demons are keeping me down. Woe is me. Woe is me. It's almost embarrassingly transparent when you really look at it. Lam V turning people into cockroaches. It's just a Kafkaesque trope layered into a morality tale. Chi Xiang, he's just Anubis with a different coat of paint. And you know that archway I mentioned, the one that Qian Ya was supposed to haunt. I knew someone who found it. There was nothing on the other side but concrete. It's all superstitious drivel, the plague. The misery in the walled city isn't the fault of demons or devils. We created it, and we perpetuate it. We blamed made-up monsters for our own failings. There's nothing more pathetic than that. Uh, yeah, what about the shared dreams? I don't know. Mass psychosis? Or maybe something magical is going on. But it's not them. They aren't real. They can't be. Anyway, that's enough for now, huh? I'm sure that gives you plenty to chew on. My obligation to give you an answer is satisfied, I think. So let's talk about something else. Uh, yeah, what did you think about the last... What, you did come on the last... Yes, you did. 
Oh, okay. Nope, sorry. Jacking into the octopus is how I relax after a long day of work. Some people go to sports bars or strip clubs. I do this. As a rule, I don't spoil my leisure time with shop talk. Uh, sure. Whatever. Yep, gob jet. Later. Gob it, you want to teach me some wisdom. Gobbit looks up from a dented tin of oysters at the sound of your approach. Her rats, madness and folly, scurry from her hips to her shoulders. Two sets of beady red eyes fix themselves on you. Hey Seattle, oyster? She spears a gray lump of seafood with a fingernail and extends it to you. It smells like low tide at municipal at a municipal pier. Um Fuck, sure, why not? You pop the rubbery wad of flesh into your mouth and chew. An explosion of lukewarm brine is your reward. Good, right? Half repressed memories of dumpster diving in the barrens dance a merry jig in your brain as the mangled oyster slides down your throat. Uh, I've eaten worse. Exactly, right? It might may not be fine dining, but it's seafood and isn't made of soy. That makes it good in my book. So what can I do for you? Um Hey, you said you'd teach me how to become a better shadow runner. You still remember that, do you, huh? I just sort of assumed you'd laugh that off. <laughs> nope, no dice, wise and mentor. You offered? Now you gotta pay up, lady. <sighs> okay, how about this? I'll tell you a story about a run gone bad. You tell me what you'd have done in the runner's place, and we'll compare notes on your answer. How does that sound? Sure. She sweeps a tangled rope of hair out of her eyes and back over one pointed ear. After a moment of silent contemplation, she bites her lip and nods. Okay, so this is a story from early in my career. I was part of a team here in Hong Kong, but I did some occasional moonlighting for another group based out of Macau. I was a busy kid. <laughs> early in your career. So what, you were like 12? Mm. You say that like I could have been. When I was 12, I could have dis I could have destroyed you. Okay. And also I was 16, practically an adult in orc years. We grew up fast. Anyway, the job was a hit on this tower. Sort of a trid multiplex slash apartment complex. I'm sure they've got them in Seattle, too. You know the kind. Seven huge screens, monster concession stand, coffin apartments on top like barnacles on a whale. Um... I lived in one for a while, sure. That sounds good. Yeah, that'll happen. Our client wanted us to break into one of the apartments. The story was of a, that an ex of hers, a guy named Boggs, lived there. She'd been cooped up with him until about a week prior, and then things went sour in a big way. She wanted us to get back some things that Boggs kept when he kicked her out. Scare the shit out of him, bloody him up a bit, make it look like a robbery. You know the deal. Yeah, standard smash and grab. Maybe. Yeah, it was pretty bush league, but the pay was decent enough. Not the sort of thing you'd turn down. So anyway, sibilance. That was our group leader. Had a plan. We knew that we had to go in quiet because the Metroplex had a panic system wired directly to the HKPF. If we'd gone in shooting, we'd been we'd have been drowning in cops within ten minutes. Sib thought we could maybe take advantage of the apartment's terrible soundproofing and kick in Bog's door when the movie got loud. We'd camp out near his doorway, wait for the ceiling to start raining plaster, then smash our way in with his neighbors none the wiser. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, it doesn't sound like a bad plan. <clears throat> well, it had the virtue of being simple. I'll give it that. But still, that didn't stop things from going the way they did. So we waited in the hall, just like sibilance planned. We had a guy in the, on the elevator, another at the stairs, and I was waiting by the floor's communal kitchen. Sib took up a position by the door. She had these cyber legs that she'd dumped a ton of Nuyen into. Hydraulic jacks, strength enhancements, the works. Girl could probably leg press a dump truck. Come to think of it, most of her plans involved kicking things. There's something a little sad about that. Um, yeah, I mean, if that was her thing, she's... I don't know. That's cool. Yeah, you're very supportive. Me, I'd have preferred to work for someone who thought with her head instead of her robot legs. Anyway, we heard a boom from downstairs. Felt the walls shake with the reverb. Sib wheeled back and gave the door a massive kick, just as she'd planned. From where I was standing, I couldn't really see what happened next. I could hear a massive crack as her boot slapped, slammed into Duraplast. The door flew off its hinges. Exploded off might be a more accurate phrase. A second later, we heard an ungodly crash. There was a moment of silence, then Sib let out this little gasp. The apartment was in shambles. It looked like a hurricane had hit it. Everything was trashed, everything but the door, which was miraculously still in one piece. Remember, this was a coffin apartment. It wasn't much wider than the door was to begin with. And Boggs. What was left of him was under the door, too. Oh no. Yeah, it wasn't good. Boggs was dead, and the stuff we'd been sent there to recover had been smashed to bits. And then the building alarm went off. So that's the situation. Our payday's smashed. My temporary teammates are all standing around with stupid looks on their faces. The cops are coming. I'm standing by the kitchen. What would you have done in my place? <clears throat> um, hmm. Let's see. Uh, yeah, maybe improvise. See if there's something in the kitchen. Good thinking. As it happens, there was. And I knew just what to do with it. The thought popped into my head, and I just went with it. That's a lesson to remember, Seattle. The first answer you come up with is almost always the best one you're going to have. So just roll with it. Don't second-guess yourself. Don't hesitate. Just act. You'll live longer that way. Now, when I think crowded theater, I think place where you can't shout fire, because it'll cause a panic. And then I thought, cops don't charge into burning buildings. They help people get out of them. And as it happened, I had the means to create a real, genuine fire sitting right across from me, a pair of industrial ovens. That's a horrible fucking idea. What? You set the building on fire? I encouraged it to burn, opened the gas fence wide, and set the range on a timer and motored back into the hallway. The others had started arguing amongst themselves. I told them to snap out of it and follow me down into the lobby. We had to clear the hallway before an errant spark took the whole floor out. Unfortunately, the rest of the group wouldn't listen. Sib and the rest of the team were too busy arguing about the relative merits of her. Let's kick things really hard and see what happens tactical system. To want anything to do with me. I shouted back to them that the kitchen was going to explode and continued down the hallway. Just like I'd planned, I'd got out of the run one piece. So did every single one of the people in that m multiplex. My fire plan worked beautifully. If the rest of the team had listened to me, they might have gotten out of the building too. Kind of a bummer that they didn't. At least the run turned out well for me. Um, how? Well, I couldn't collect any pay because the run had been a disaster. But after the explosion, I got to ride in the front of the fire truck, and they gave me cookies and a blanket. 
I wound up dating one of those firemen a few weeks later. All things considered, it could have gone a lot worse. What the fuck sort of story was that? <laughs> no, that doesn't help anything, Gobbit. Uh, the moral is... <laughs> I don't know, man. All of these. Go with your gut, I guess. <coughs> sure. Yeah. That's... That's not great. Uh, yeah, how about renaming the ship? Yeah, sure. I considered a bunch of times. I never really cared enough to actually do it, though. You want to call her something else? I'm open to it. <laughs> the Big Texas. That's what we're calling her. Tell me you don't love it. Uh, yeah, sure, that's... that's pretty good, Seattle. You got a gold star for that one. A lone star, you mean. Um, we're using it, right? Sure, why the hell not? The Big Texas. That's just what we'll call her. I'm sure Iz will be thrilled. So how do you like life here on the Big Texas? It's fine, shaping up. Having new roomies is always nice. How are you enjoying your cabin? Comfy enough for you? Yeah, it's not bad. I've heard stories about the Redmond Barons. Sounds like a real winner of a place. Kowloon isn't any better, of course, but at least our little slice of home is safe. I'll take the big Texas over the Barons any day. That's the spirit. Uh, are you sure the siblings and the rest of that uh, Macau team are dead? Well, they weren't with me when I got evacuated the rest of the movie covers. I never saw them leave the building and haven't heard of them since. I guess it's possible somebody made it. But I don't really run in those circles anymore. Odds are good that if anyone from the Macau team did survive, They'll have died off by now from sheer incompetence. Shadow running's an unforgiving business. You don't get to make too many mistakes. Yeah, well, that's fine. <clears throat> Let's take a nap. A stabbing pain in your stomach jolts you awake. Your entire abdomen is cramping up. You roll in your cot, willing the shooting pains that radiate from your stomach to go away. Your mouth is bone dry and your tongue is swollen. It feels thick and inarticulate, like a useless slab of meat. A quick glance at your PDA tells you it's 4 a.m. Outside your cabin, the rest of Hioi sleeps. All you remember of the dream that you awoke from is a horrible, unfulfilled yearning, and the need to get where you were going first. Others were behind you. You could feel the heat of their breath on your neck. If you were to beat them to your destination, you could slam the door in their faces, keep them out and away from what was yours. But if they overtook you, you would feel a terrible longing forever. As you grasp at your last fleeting memories of the dream, a wave of exhaustion washes over you. It feels like you've been drugged. You collapse back into your cot and into a black, dreamless sleep. When you open your eyes again, the sun filters in under your door. It's morning. Sweet. It's morning here on the big Texas. How you doing, Dunk? You're back. Need anything else? 
Uh, and we already talked about this with him. Right? Yeah, why do you think Raymond came to Hong Kong? Well, he, he's from here, right? Sounds like he had unfinished business that he needed to take care of before... You think he's dying? I don't know. Yeah, me either. Just something to think about. Let's talk about something else. You said you had a dream. Yeah, we're talking about this stuff. Let's. He's not very helpful. <clears throat> Let's go on this uh, party party gig. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, maybe we will go buy a new drone to celebrate. What's up, Matthew? Reliable Matthew stands quietly at his drone lot, arms hanging limply at his sides. He stares silently at the ground. This isn't the soft-spoken style of many Hong Kongers. He looks sad. He looks up briefly as you approach, but quickly looks back at the ground. Hey, the plague. Oh yeah, what's the matter? You don't see yourself, dude. Can you do me a favor, the plague? I can't leave the lot right now. Sure. I was supposed to pick up my medicine this morning, but I overslept. Can you get it from Ambrose for me? Sure. So, alright, let's go get his meds. <coughs> Before you leave this general area, though, let's, um... Uh, is there a point in talking to... Gene, Gene, whatever? Probably not. Let's go talk to uh, the shaman lady. Welcome back. Here to buy or here to chat? Um. Uh, so yeah. She doesn't have anything new for us. Great. Sure then, get me updated again. Like we're having a lot of the same same dialogue. Like why 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 are options even there still if it's literally just the same thing we've already talked about? <sighs> Whatever. <clears throat> I don't know if that's just like... how the game is normally, or if there's something weird going on with with my game in particular, like it's a bug or something. Oh, we never did talk to Maximum uh, Law again. Maximum Law surveys the docks from beneath his meticulously patched tarpaulin. Goggled and belted with electronics, his arms folded, his expression stern. A sweat-drenched little king, his boat rocks gently. As you approach, he looks sharply your way and breaks into an awkward smile. Hey there, the plague. I was hoping you'd come around. You got a minute? Sure. Kindly had Wampoa burn your sin. Word is you're doing stuff for not normal yellow lotus stuff. You know, shadow running. Yeah, I've got to eat. Wicked. That's pretty ironclad, the plague. Pretty vicious. If you do good, you'll be noticed. 
Listen, if you've uh, got some info about runs, I can make it worth something. We want Poens call that kind of thing metadata. Wampoa likes to get the word on the street from the active operators. Yeah, I can hook you up with some, maybe creds, maybe some sweet programs. But really, you'll gain face with Wampoa. That counts for a lot more than money. Augmented rally goggles aside, this gig gets really boring sometimes. If you ever want to talk shop, I'm here. Uh, yeah, later, man. So, when we get, like, pay data, is that the sort of stuff that he would want? Like, instead of selling it on the BBS, should I have been bringing it to him? Oh, fuck, let's go hang out in the club for a moment. Walking in a small circle is as close as I can come to dancing. Docks down here. What up, Doc? Hey, my fellow Crunchery Woman returns. You want some chips and dip? Help yourself, it's on the engine block. There's a big Sahara Combat League race tonight. Everybody's coming over. You want to come? Nah, I bet Kindly's keeping you busy. I'm here for reliable Matthews medicine. Oh yeah, actually, I'm curious. Why haven't you installed some bionic limbs? Because <laughs> I'm already chrome to the gills. I don't look it, but I've got a full suite. Quad jacks, no soft, radio, skill wire, tactical computer, a whole bunch of rigor wear. Check it out. I've got an artificial liver in my chair. What the f I want to keep my last essence. I've come to like my humanity. I don't want to turn into one of the walking dead. Yeah, good call, man. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Yeah, gimme, give gimme give reliable Matthews meds. A Waldo arm opens a cabinet and crackles through the packaging. In a moment, it swings over to you, holding a plastic cylinder about the size of a roll of breath mints. Yeah, here you go. What are they? Uh, sorry, the plague. I can't discuss a patient's treatment without permission. Confidentiality and Hippocratic Oath and all that stuff. That's bullshit, and you know it. Hey, I don't tell random people about the injuries your team comes in with. I sure as hell won't tell you about other patients. That's non-negotiable. The cylinder is lettered with a holographic Hanzi. Cool blue jazz, non-smoker version. It has a stylized illustration of a laid-back lounge lizard of a man wearing a zoot suit and smoking a cigarillo. Through the semi-transparent plastic, you can see a stack of what look like tiny pills or chips. Search your old memory. This looks like a tube of slow burn, better than life chips. These disposable chips create a synthetic experience. Unlike normal BTLs, which burn hot and fast, the sensory and emotional tracks on slow burn chips are adjusted to be only slightly above legal limits, and they last all day long. They give a gentle, subdued high. It's like you're someone else, but still living your life. Yeah, why are you giving him BTLs? <sighs> like I said, patient confidentiality. I can't talk about it. This is medicine. If you want to ask more, ask Maddie. Maddie? Well, let's go call him that. Later, man.
So he has BTL chips, and he has like an army of cuddlebots inside of his van or whatever. Matthew must be extremely depressed. <sighs> Hi, the plague. Did you get my medicine? <laughs> no, I just need to buy a drone. Yeah, here's your medicine. What is this stuff? It's my medicine. It makes me feel better. It makes all this okay. Here, give it to me. Matthew, I can't let you have this. No, let's give it to him. Matthew hastily takes the cylinder from you. His hands shake as he dispenses a single chip from it. He pulls back his hair and slots the chip into a hidden data track. He stands stock still, eyes closed. His eyeballs flutter, your eyelids flutter. A ripple moves through his body. His eyes snap open. He flashes you a vacant grin. Hey, beautiful. Boy, am I glad to be back. The day was a little dreary there for a while, but now I'm back and I'm in fighting shape. Time to push some tin. Oh, you just slotted a synthetic personality, my dude. No siree, beautiful. This puppy's authentic. Genuine authentic. Authentically awesome. Woo wow, smell that fresh air. Feel victory. Some lucky soul's gonna get a great deal on a drone today, the plague. All thanks to you. Oh man. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I should really butt in more into his business. Like, is this really hurting him in any way? Just now, helps him get his customer server service face on. I kind of do want to just high five him. Yeah, sure. Rocket Matthew, high five. Woo! Boom boom. Ba do ba boo ba doom. Catch you later, hot stuff. What the fuck was that? Ba do ba boo ba boom. Ba I can't even say that. Ba do ba boo ba ba doom. <laughs> uh, I can't say it right. That's fine. No, fuck, I didn't want to end the conversation. Give me your drones. I want drones. Uh, do we get an outfit? I don't think I can afford both now. <sighs> fuck. I think I'd rather have the drone. Sorry, Doberman. I've got a new puppy. Let's sell the Doberman, in fact. He was a good Doberman. I'm sure he'll find a good home. I guess our new one isn't a puppy, it's a kitty. It's a steel lynx. Yeah, and we can afford the nice armor. Cool beans. Let's sell our old armor. I'm trying to get a look at myself. 
Oh yeah, that looks way cooler than our previous armor. Pretty happy with that. Now we have a job to do. We have to go to a party, and so Gaichu is probably a horrible idea to bring, so let's not. do I know about it? Let's let's go read the thing again, actually. I don't know if I want to bring Ractor or Duncan. I could bring both and leave Gobbit here. Um... Dig up some dirt. Oh, so that doesn't tell me anything more. Okay. We'll take Izzy. We'll take Gobbit. Uh, I don't think we need Ractor, I guess. Yeah, we'll just go with like the main main group. Duncan Gobbit and Izzy. I do wanna see the you know Koshe's update though. Yeah, Decker in case we got a hex. Oh, I can only bring two. Oh no, okay, I bring three. Okay, and they've been upgrading, so Gobbit has haste two now. That's handy. You arrive at the eponymously named Repulse Bay, a gleaming hotel and apartment building on the shores of Repulse Bay, Hong Kong Island. Roiling, rolling storm clouds choke the sky, lending the structure a sinister appearance. As you push through the doors and into the building, a sudden break in the clouds reveals a sun that's gone red as blood. You make your way into a ground floor elevator. The attendant pays you no mind. As the car begins to climb, you hear the sounds of merriment drawing closer. As the doors slide open, you find Neville Ma's party in full swing. Um, whew. So let's see. We have what we want. Uh, Isabelle, is there anything I can give you? I have this extra med kit, I guess I should give it to someone. I'll give it to you, Gobbit. And you already have the spell, so I can't get... Oh. Or you don't. Wait, so what's the difference? Oh, Wild Aim is way better. Oh, does she not have the required spellcasting? Okay. Well, that's lame. No, we don't want to use up our mummy talisman. That was special. I think. I wonder if it's any good, actually. Um... Who do we give this grenade to? Dunk? Yeah, here's a grenade. And yeah, maybe we'll take the stupid mummy. Yep, looks good.
The elevator disgorges you into the mezzanine with a little fanfare. Off in the distance, you can hear the sounds of clinking glasses, carefree laughter, and silverware on China. Isn't all silverware in Hong Kong silverware on China? I'm kind of out of my element here, the plague. Not much of a party person. How do you want to handle this? Check the apartment first? My vote's party. Can we go to the party? Um, fuck yeah, party. If you think you can get us in, lead the way. The catering at these things is always top-notch. We're talking caviar of the plague. Booze with gold flecks in it. I think I might smell pheasant. I don't understand how you can be hungry. I just watched you power down a dozen dumplings and a pitcher of oxtail soup. Oh, I'm not hungry. Don't think I could eat another bite. But I do have a messenger bag and about 20 empty pockets. Come on, the plague. Let's go mingle. Yeah, we go to the party first because I wasted points upping my charisma just to become a socialite. And I, that had better actually come into play. <laughs> uh, so which room is which? Penelope Wong. Oh man, I'd love to meet her. She's so glamorous. Hmm. Buddha's delight. A sun-looking troll stands on the periphery of the kitchen. He turns to you, shoulders slumped forward and sighs. No restaurant service tonight. Kitchen staff's too busy with the party to serve anyone. Wish I could get out onto that balcony. All that delicious food. Uh, why can't you get in? It says guests only. The guy throwing it seems connected to the trade industry. Tons of actors in there. Some of them from Promises and Moonlight. You know the show, right? Afraid not. Oh man, you need to see it. It's the best show on Tridio ever. Ever. Uh, sure. Good luck, man. Let's talk to a waiter. The ragged waiter manages to straighten up as you approach. Good evening, ma'am. Welcome to the veranda at the Repulse Bay. How may I be of service? What's with the guard? Why, well, there's a private party outside, and our establishment provides security for any event that requires it. But don't worry, the balcony will be free again in a few hours. Yeah, we'll come back and talk to you if we need to. What up, security? Private party, pal. Invitation only. Yeah, are you kidding me? I was just in there talking to Kevin Chu. Don't tell me you've already forgotten my face. Uh, yeah, yeah, I remember you. Uh, talking to Kevin Chu. Ter terribly sorry, man. Won't happen, won't, won't happen again. Really? That fucking easy? We didn't even need socialite. I feel like I've wasted that charisma. Let me go look. So we need five charisma for that option. So I guess we didn't entirely waste it. But I could have saved six karma by not picking up socialite. Damn it. Okay. Let's talk to the producer. They're serving century-old Cabernet-like punch here. It's hard to believe, considering how much a single bottle costs. But it's even harder to believe Miss Ma's hosting this party. Or Mr. Ma, sorry. And soon, and so soon after his accident. Yeah, 
Yeah, it doesn't seem to have slowed him down. The man's a machine. Not literally, but he might as well be. The way he sprang back after being T-boned at 140 clicks an hour. Yeah, seriously, you should look like cat food after an impact like that. I don't know how, but here he is, alive and kicking. We're dining, regaling, what have you. If you ask me, it's all that positive key the fans have stirred up. I heard there were entire message boards praying for him and making offerings at temples. The Matrix is nuts for promises in Moonlight. If Ma hadn't negotiated a second season, his fans would just have easily turned on him. Now if that's all it takes to get immortality, maybe I should become famous too. Isn't that why we're all here? To be famous, become famous, or make someone else famous. Lisa, over here! It's nice talking to you. How about you, Penelope? Good evening, Penelope Wong, but please call me Penny. Pleased to meet you, Penny. My name's Argyle. What brings you to our little soiree, Miss Argyle? I don't believe I've seen you around the studio before. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just checking up on... Neville, or, hmm. Yeah, it's just biz, but I'm surprised Mr. Ma's up and up and about so soon after. We all are, I must admit. I nearly died of fright when I heard what happened. But to look at Neville now, you'd never guess he'd been hurt. It's miraculous, isn't it? Huh. Maybe we should have gone to his apartment first to dig up, like, clues on him. I'll keep his secret if you will. It's a shame the rumors caught wind, though. There are rumors? I haven't heard any rumors. Huh. You wouldn't believe the things people are saying. Embezzlement, secret partners, and other such chicanery. I'm sure it's all nonsense. That's ridiculous. The studio's doing better than ever. We're even expanding. No money lost there. Yeah, I suppose that Neville's gotten some new investors then. Someone new? No, I don't think so. But Neville did make some new friends while he was in Guangzhou. Go on! There was a woman, can't remember her name, who now visits Neville regularly. I hear she's quite the fashionista. Well, a powerful man like him must make a lot of friends. They seem to get on well. I'm a little sad he's never introduced us, though. She's supposed to make an appearance tonight. I'm very much looking forward to meeting her. Oh, p please excuse me. That's Mr. Yao. And I promised him I'd say hello tonight. Enjoy the party. Huh. I think I'm going to reload, because I think I've done this in potentially the wrong order. I think I need to find the incriminating evidence, then come here and have, like, something more solid to give Penelope out here. Ah, uh, we'll see. Neville Ma is dressed in an immaculate suit, surveying his party from the edge of the balcony. 
As you approach, he inclines his head respectfully. Good evening, Miss Ma. I'm sorry, I don't believe we've been... Er, good evening, Miss. I'm sorry, I don't believe we've been formally introduced. I'm Neville Ma, owner of Yellow Spring Studios. Miss Ar Argyle. I do my best. Appearances are important in Hong Kong. If you look weak, that's how you'll be treated. Make a show of prosperity and it will follow. I'm sure everyone's glad your action hasn't hindered you. I blame the news feeds for that. They made the accident seem much more serious than it was. My car was destroyed, true, but I emerged largely unscathed. And how'd that accident happen? It seems as though that's all anyone wants to hear about these days. To be honest, I'm getting rather tired of repeating the story. Suffice it to say, a delivery truck, a drone, experienced a glitch and ran a red light. If it hadn't hit me, it would have hit someone else. Do you think it was intentional? <laughs> what, the glitch? I can't rule it out. That seems rather far-fetched to me. I'm just a Tridio producer. Hardly the sort of man to find himself on anybody's enemy enemies list. I already made a new friend at the hospital. Oh, fuck you, Windows. Not today. Sorry. Yes, Miss Feng. She's quite an admirer of promises in moonlight. She kept my spirits up as I was recovering from the accident. Uh, what line of work is she in? Well, she's independently wealthy. I believe that she was an early investor in Eastern Tiger during their expansion several years ago. Your treatments must have been pretty expensive, my dude. Uh, not especially. Guangzhou's hospitals are top tier. Confidentially, my rapid recovery mostly came down to luck. Their recovery could have been a lot worse than it was. I owe Eurocar a lot of thanks for their safety features. Uh, so party was a bit of a bust. Hopefully we'll get dialogue options again after... What is this? Is this, um... What is this door? It's just a little maintenance closet? Sure. You know what? No, 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 no. Let's save. Okay, or not. And yeah, that's just an observer. Let's go to the party second, go to the apartment first. Oh, I have to give out items again. Jeez. You take this, mommy, take this. You take another grenade. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's try the apartment first. Izzy Jackin. What is this? Tar Blaster.
so okay. Oh no! Fuck. Um, we didn't quite make it out. Can a killer 2.0 just take it out and walk it? Maybe. No, we missed. Oh, well, that's not good. Wow, we've uh, really screwed the pooch here. Damn it. Here, tar blast. I can't believe we messed up that bad. They're missing a lot too. Uh, so let's go here. Let's tar blast. Oh, nice. Is it too late for this? Cannot cast this. Yeah, it doesn't do anything. Uh, hmm. That's fine. Search for information on Neville. Penthouse apartment number two, 1635. Planned hotel expansion. Oh, nice, pay data. Maintenance? Events. Oh, an invitation? Oh, man. I'm still going to use my charisma, though. Uh, so that could have gone better, but still. So we have the door code, 1635. That seems like a real easy job. Or not, what is that sound? Why is there like Cthulhu whispers in here? Why is it so cold in here? I can see my breath. Oh, uh, let me mark it. Uh, we have freezing temperatures in my journal. Let me mark it. What type of ghost is it? Let's look at the suits. Rows and rows of finely tailored suits, custom shoes, and various accessories fill this room. Oh, okay. Spooky kitchen. Let's look at the liquor. The liquor cabinet's full of expensive wines and spirits. Several decanters sit atop it, but one in particular catches your eye. 
a bottle of brilliantly bright red wine. Oh fuck, do we sip it? We have to, right? You take a gulp and quickly gag. The wine's strangely warm given the temperature of the room and the- Oh, it's blood! Hope this is not Chris's blood. Yeah, lesson learned. Gross. Oh. I have. I don't care if it's cat piss or Zeus's tears. What I do care about is that you've just left DNA evidence in an apartment we've broken into. Just take the bottle with us, then. <sighs> I swear the plague. Sometimes... I'm glad we brought Duncan. He can clean up our evidence. Uh, that's disgusting. Why Why is there a big bottle of blood in here? And I'm stuck. I'm literally stuck. Y'all body blocking me. Really? Is this... Am I going to have to reload? I can't move. Okay, that's... What? I'm still in a dialogue? A dialogue I can't escape from. Um, hmm. Yeah, it looks like I'm going to have to reload because this is, uh, this is fucked. Well, that sucks. Rewind to. I'm gonna have to do all that stupid Matrix shit again. I should have saved after that. Oh, okay, this makes it way easier. I know this tab existed. There we go. Uh, so we'll do our hacking stuff, and then we will save the game. Yeah, that's fine. Let's try the apartment first. Maybe I won't drink the blood in case that somehow freezes the game. It makes me real sad though. Try and pay more attention to their pattern. Probably going around here is actually the safest bet, right? Oh, that's just real hard. There's like a moment here when I could get across. This. Oh, 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 oh. oh my god. Okay, I think this square is safe.
So this one just moves back and forth on this line. Yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah. Time to hack. This one? I think it is. Okay, it was. Let's get the deets. Sweet. Yeah, download the invitation. Get the pay data. We don't have any reason to search for maintenance logs now, but we probably will later. Awesome! And we did way better that time. In and out without leaving any trace. I like it. Let's go upstairs and then I'll save. I'm not forgetting the save. Save game. Confirm. Input code sixteen thirty five. Jeez, even from like outside the door, you can hear the Eldritch whispers. Uh, so we'll look at the blood, but we won't drink it this time. Don't drink it. We don't want to piss off Duncan. The opposite side of the living room is dominated by a massive security door. It's much heavier than the exterior apartment door, and it looks like a recent addition. The wall has clearly been reinforced to support it. A series of top-of-the-line commercial-grade maglocks holds the door sealed. It'd be easier to tunnel through the wall than it would be to break them open. A cursory glance at the door frame reveals no sign of a keypad or a jack point, but you do see what appears to be an RFID reader. A 16-digit number has been stenciled into the side of the reader in red ink. This didn't come with the apartment. Why fortify an interior door like this? Probably to keep up appearances. Can you imagine how people would talk if he'd installed this thing in the hallway? Well, one thing is certain. We aren't getting through there without a key. Most likely that means we'll have to get one from Ma, or from one of his people. <laughs> we're going to the party, aren't we? I mean, that is the next logical step. Tell me we're going to the party. Saddle up. We've got a party to attend. But one of the staff might have it. We'll talk to the staff, too. The fridge is well stocked. There's enough food here to feed a big party. It's okay. We have nothing up here. Go back down. Let's look at this again. It's Buddha's whatever the hell. Buddha's delight. We've already talked. 
Yeah, we've already talked to this guy. Wants to go watch the show, that's fine. I wonder if this waiter guy has uh, the key that we need. Good evening, ma'am. Welcome to the veranda at the Repulse Bay. How may I be of service? Oh, questions about Neville. Uh, certainly, everyone knows Mr. Ma. Yeah, what kind of guy is he? Between you and me, he's difficult, which is putting it lightly. Man runs the staff ragged. That's his party out there. Richies like him love to display their wealth. Seems like you have some stories. <laughs> like you wouldn't believe. He once made a handful of us walk all the way out to Sheko. Sheko? To fetch dumplings for his guests. It was pouring out and the winds blowing around 50 kilometers per hour. Practically a death march in that weather. Why didn't the kitchen here make Ma some dumplings? That's a good question. Uh, Ma said the kitchen's dumplings weren't good enough. Called them peasant food in front of all his guests. Chef Kong was furious, of course, but since Ma's rich, hotel management told us to give him whatever he wanted. By the time we got back from Sheko, the dumplings were cold, the party was over, and Ma had retired to his suite with a pair of starlets. We had to pay for those dumplings out of our own damn pockets. A couple of days later, Kevin came down with pneumonia from the trip, lost his job over it. That's just one of our experiences with him. Needless to say, no one here is a fan of the man, but we're paid to serve the tenants here, so that's what we do. It's a living. Um, hmm. Let's not talk to him about the heavy security order. That seems weird. He might have a key, but I'm thinking we can go look at those maintenance logs with that number that was in red. Uh, so it's kind of a pain that we have Jack in here again, but... Why did we do that? Why the fuck did we do that? Please hit, please hit. Oh, uh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, yeah, okay. Whew. That was close. We almost had to do a big fight. Maintenance. Enter the reference number on my security door. You enter the number that was stenciled on the door. The system chugs for a moment, then the screen fills with data. Security door installation. Ma, Neville. Keys issued. Three of three. One, Ma, Neville. Two, Wong, Penelope. Three, Kong, Victor. All keys claimed. So that didn't give us anything. Just told us that, yep, people at the party have those keys. That's uh, so not the way it is. As well. What was the waiter's name? Yeah, never mind. Actually, yeah, you look like you could use a break. Bad luck with the horses, oh. I'm in a pretty lucrative trade myself. Care to make a deal? I'm listening. Oh, yeah, never mind. If that's all you've got. Here you go, invitation. Um, let's talk to the producer, maybe. So if I was on the deets, what happened? I should look at cat food. Ok, 
guess this is just all that we've already talked about. Freaking hell. Where can I get a key fob? Name's Argyle. We're representing some interested parties who like to collaborate with uh, Yellow Spring Studios. Rumor mill. Okay, so this is just like all the options that we already had. Aha! One last thing before you go, Penny. Do you have a key fob for Neville's security door? Geez, which of these is the most convincing? She does have a fob. Let's see. This last one doesn't make sense to me. If Neville asked me to get something for him, wouldn't he have just given me the fob then and there? That doesn't make sense to me. Building management. Let's go with this one. Building management told me they sent me down to see if I could bring them your fob. They need to fix a glitch and then won't bother Mr. Ma. Oh, okay. Easy peasy. We'll come back and talk to you, Neville, once we find some incriminating information. So we're probably going to fight some sort of weird horror. So let's do it. As you approach the door, a light set into your key fob goes from red to green. There's a loud series of thunks and the door slides open. A blast of frigid air floods into the room from the other side. Wow, that's a nice bathroom. I'd take a shit in there. An expensive, consumer-grade computer terminal awaits your input. The display background is set to a screen capture from Promises in Moonlight. Penelope Wong's radiant face beams at you from the corner of the screen. This must be Ma's personal terminal. Can't think of a better place to dig for dirt on the man. A few keystrokes is all it takes to get into the computer's file structure. It's a Unix system. I know this. And with the high-tech security door in his apartment, it seems Ma never bothered to encrypt his machine. Search email. You read through Ma's email. Most of it's spam and boring business arrangements, but one detail stands out. Neville Ma is frequently emailing a woman named Ku Feng. They seem close, exchanging a lot of thinly veiled flirtation. It appears that Neville has been lavishing Ku Feng with money and affection. Expensive gifts, rent checks, miserable attempts at poetry. Seeing to it that her every need is met. Neville's financial records are astoundingly boring, aside from two major things. He spent next to nothing on his hospital bills, where it appears he only stayed for three days. And he's spending a lot of money on a woman named Ku Feng. 
jewelry, bills, clothes, and such. With a push of a button, you unlock the office door on the other side of the room. An ominous thunk reverberates throughout the cold steel apartment. Okay, it's spooky and foggy in here. Without warning, a frigid wind blows through the apartment. The chill cuts through your clothes and raising goose flesh all over your body. Where's that coming from? There's another blast of cold, and a pale and imposing woman materializes out of thin air. A throng of blank-faced men and women materialize alongside her. Is this Kufeng? Ah, the little dog who's been sniffing around Neville Ma's affairs. Kufeng, I presume. Just so. My servants have been watching you since you arrived. I suspect you're an evil woman and that you're here to do harm to Neville, and so I came to stop you. She, she thinks I'm evil. I don't want to hurt Neville at all, actually. If that's true, then it's a shame. You've seen my face, and you know what I am. Naturally. What, wait, what are you? Are you a vampire? Naturally, I cannot allow you to leave. And you can't afford to fight me here, for fear of police involvement. Perhaps we can settle this in a more civilized manner. A face-off in a neutral location. Will you accept my challenge? What? Sure. Very well. As for the terms, if I win, you willingly submit to my influence. You become my pawn. And if you win, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Hmm. Wait 15 minutes for the sun to go down, then come to the roof. We'll settle this there, like gentlemen and ladies. All right, sure. We're having a midnight duel with a vampire, maybe? The sun dips below the horizon. Mist coalesces, coating the rooftop in dew. Kufeng and her cohorts appear. Okay, she's looking a little bit different now. Are you prepared to become my servant, elf? You must not resist, or I'll be forced to kill you. Should it come to that, I'll endeavor to make it swift and painless, but no promises. I'm ready if you are, baby. This will be entertaining. Kill her! Why are you ordering them to kill me when you want me to submit to you? Like, we weren't trying to kill each other. Um, what else? Luckily, I have the power of drones on my side. Let's go here. Wow, there's a lot of enemies. Isabel, put out a proximity grenade, please. Right there will do. Okay, uh, that's a fun spot too. Oh yeah, wait, we can beanbag shot him. I missed. Um, 
want to kill them if we body blow them anyways, so... I probably shouldn't have hasted that. I'm done. Yeah, I don't think I'll be able to do this non-lethally. I'm going to have to kill some of these people. Crap. Uh, can we sucker punch this guy? Yes, and let's subdue him. You're under arrest, sir. Okay, one down, non-lethal. been injured? Uh, no, just not really. I have, but barely. And you hang back here, Gobbit. Isabel, you need to be in cover. We just be taking out Kufeng and not focusing on these civilians. That's probably a good idea. Yeah, drones, you guys come out here. Vampire, what's she going to do to drones? Uh, dunk. What moves do you still have? Next turn, you can beanbag this dude. For now, um, now hang out back here. Please don't kill me. <laughs> Fuck. That did like nothing. Oh, I won't be able to subdue this turn. Crap. So she's a half elf. Isabel, please heal main character. Thank you. keep dunking close enough to subdue that dude, so I can't really move very far with him. Please don't destroy my drone. He's a good boy.
Okay, they're splitting up their attacks because they're dumb. Let's subdue this guy. There we go. Oh, and my drums is asleep. Isabel, you can take some hits. Get out of here. Oh, I can just turn him back. What? I understand. Why can't I turn that drone on? What's wrong with him? Be very unhappy if she kills my drone. Okay, nice. Up again. Yeah. Oh, come on, don't kill my drone, please, please, please. Pretty please. easy. Kufeng's calm and haughty demeanor dissolves as her eyes grow wild. Wait, wait, I surrender. Don't kill me. What's wrong, not feeling so powerful now? The whole mistress of the night thing is just an act. I'm just an accountant, an accountant that got infected. I, I don't really know how to fight. I was faking it. I just wanted to scare you into backing down. And an accountant. I was on a business trip to Sean Wei last year. I went to a rave, got drunk, and passed out. When I woke up, I was in an alley and someone had done this to me. Yeah, I don't need to hear your life story. Just tell me what you hope to get out of all this. I don't know. Money? Power? Both? Like I said, I don't know the first thing about how to be a real vampire. I figured if I was smart about it, I could maybe build my own little thing here. Like a business and become the vampire queen of Repulse Bay. Well, I can't fault your ambition. Thanks. I mean that. <sighs> That's never going to happen. I'm not any good at this. I know that now. I don't even know what I'm going to do with myself now. If I'm ever found out, I'll get killed for the bounty money. This is my only real shot, and I blew it. How did you manage to survive? I've been hiding out in Kowloon. I was hoping to just disappear. As far as my friends and family know, I'm missing, maybe dead. I think that's for the best. I mean, how could I explain what I'd become? Can you imagine how ashamed my family would be to find that I became this monster? No, it's better they think I'm dead. So, uh, can we call a truce or something? I scratch your back, you let me live? What do you say? Yeah, we work something out. Yes, yes, anything. Just tell me what you need. 
I want some answers. How are you and Neville connected? I happen to be in the same hospital he was, trolling for a meal. I don't like to drink blood from unwilling people, so I go to hospitals at night looking for people who wouldn't mind if I take a sip. People in comas, patients with terminal illnesses, that kind of thing. It makes me feel better about what I have to do. So, I wandered into this room, and I recognized Neville Ma. I'd seen him on the news, seen photos of the accident. He was in really bad shape. A lot of broken bones and internal injuries. But somehow, he was still conscious. So you offered help? Well, I knew that if I gave uninfected people my blood, they'd be able to heal like I did, just not as fast. I'd figured that out early, and by mistake. But it can come in handy from time to time. So when I saw that Neville was conscious, I decided to make my grand appearance. I materialized in the room and told him I'd make him a trade. I'd fix him up, good as new, but he'd owe me some favors for it. I wasn't specific as to how many favors or what kind. He agreed. Actually, he leapt at the chance to become my pawn. I guess that when you're all broken up like that, you'll do just about anything to get better. The deal was done, and we got along. I think he's charming, he thinks I'm funny, and he doesn't care that I'm a vampire. He told me he gives me nice things because he likes me, and not because he owes me his life. It's all very sweet. Is there a cure? I wish, but no. The only cure is being tossed in a bonfire or having your head cut off. And almost every nation in the world will pay a bounty for a dead vampire. It's not like I had much of a choice, you know. Be a vampire, get killed for some quick cash. It's a pretty raw deal for me either way. Uh. Huh. Oh fuck, which option should I go with? Don't get Neville to fire Penelope. Live up to your potential, I'm going to help you. That is one I'm super curious about. Um, hell. Um, That sounds pretty awesome. Having like a vampire friend? You know, we're setting up like people who owe us favors and contacts and stuff like just like that other shadow running group. Yeah, let's do it. I'm gonna help you. You are? Yeah, I am. <laughs> we are? Sure. Um. Yeah, Duncan and I can help you. We'll both help. Yeah, we could. But why would we? Because in Hong Kong, connections are power, and I want the vampire queen of Repulse Bay to owe me a favor. Fuck yeah, I think that's awesome, and we should definitely be doing this. Well, in that case, I accept, gratefully. <sighs> he wants Penelope Wong. Oh, and she'll fire, he'll, he'll fire Penelope. Fuck yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we'll be in touch. Or catch you later, Vampire Queen. Nah, we'll be in touch. Awesome. And we didn't even kill any of these random civilians. This was a no deaths uh, battle. Yeah, that's, that's, that's like 
Yeah, whenever I've Duncan, I, I feel like I shouldn't be killing people, especially civilians and police officers and stuff like that. Yeah, I wish more of the party had, like, non-lethal uh, abilities. But it's really powerful because Sun can just, like, shoot someone with a beanbag and then immediately take them out of the fight. Uh, so let's go talk. We don't even need to talk to Devil, so fuck it, let's just leave. Yeah, I think on any missions where it's like like this, where it's a party or something where we don't want to just go in and bust up the place, uh, I like taking Duncan. Yeah. The clink of glasses and sound of Neville Ma's party fade into the distance as you leave the Repulse Bay. As the MTR carries you toward Hioi, the mountains of Hong Kong Island roll by as looming masses obscured by rain and storm clouds. Penelope Wong has been fired from Promises in Moonlight, and Ma will be at a serious disadvantage without her. The whims of Trid viewers shift as readily as the tide, and without the Starlet's presence, Promises in Moonlight will undoubtedly lose ratings. What's more, you've managed to turn a powerful foe into a potential ally. Only time will tell how Kufang will repay you, however. So hopefully, like, all these people owing us favors is gonna come in big on, like, the final mission or some big mission. As you pass in front of the walled city, something takes hold of your chest and squeezes. An internal pang, like a panic attack, but worse. You feel your chest compress, and for a second the world turns to liquid. It takes all the effort you can muster to keep from falling over. A strobing patchwork of images flashes before your eyes, fragments of dream and sense memory all stitched together, playing on a loop in your head. Walled city residents kneeling, the churning sound of grinding gears, leaning buildings, soiled streets, used needles on a sidewalk. The images come faster and faster, teeth, thousands and thousands of teeth, the Remin barons and the first man you ever saw killed. A crown of ivory over a shimmering veil. Duncan at age 10, his legs pumping, running for his life from a pack of Halloweeners. Strange anatomy that doesn't make sense to your logical mind. A door, a heavy industrial door, something is written on it, faded yellow paint, but you can't make it out. And just like that, the slideshow ends. The images fade to nothing, returning you to the Hioi streets. The outermost facade of the walled city towers over you, huge and impressive. Oppressive. A group of kindly Cheng's blue lanterns pass you by, oblivious to the event that just took place in your head. You take a step forward, then another. You still feel woozy, but you don't need to take a knee. The event, whatever it is, is over. Your mind is your own. Uh, okay, so that's fucking a little bit scary. Brunch Sharky, who the fuck are you? Yeah, I don't actually care to talk to you, dude. It is cool though that we can like, um, it seems like random, but we do some see like the people we can hire on jobs like in the world. I like that. Whew. So let's see, see if Maximum Law here wants our pay data. There's metadata, something else. I've got some metadata. Oh, oh, okay, it's this sort of stuff. The recent heist at the Emperor's Tomb Museum, the one under construction, had a specific target, the books. Indeed, there were some sort of ancient texts, probably sorcerers, and awakened monsters had invaded the tomb. Whoa, are you serious? That's nuts. Boom, more proof of my theory, the Kong is done. 
I give it two years tops. If we're demons or something, eat everybody. <laughs> Let's see what I've got for you. Grab a program. Here's my surplus stack. Um, sure, we'll take some of these. Killjoy. I don't think I've seen that one before. Right, let's give him all the metadata, geez. Um, decrypt? Sure. Neville Miles a vampire friend? Sure, let's spread rumors. Give me that stuff. Nice. Maybe I should buy a deck. Oh, we don't have like any cash. Let's go pick up our pay. Maybe I should talk to the shaman about that weird vision I just had. Oh uh, yeah, it says Big Tex is on my ship now. It's not my ship still, but... The original name has been sloppily painted over with black paint. Freshly painted characters have been recently done in bold brush strokes and read Big Texas. I love it. Absolutely love that we can rename our ship. Oh wait, I can level up my dudes. Uh, Ractor. Augment ability repair. Oh, yes please. You, Red Samurai, Coup de Gras. Modded Flashbang. Yes please. Yeah, don't go lethal force. Make her an even better decker. And you, um, can get Poison Fog. Looks good to me. I like that for all of them are just going, like, straight in a row across. <laughs> oh, who, who are you? Mysterious Elf. Oh, it's that guy, um, what the frick is his name? He was in, in both the other games. It's that guy, right? What was his name? A quick glance around the... Why are you saying that you don't believe we've met? Uh... Why did you forget that we've met? I don't understand. Name's the plague, by the way. <sighs> Tell me, have you had the dreams? I sure have. And more than one. My mother was an avid researcher, as I've already explained to you in great detail. She kept extensive journals on her findings. These dreams we're having, they're commonplace in the Wad City. But ever since they started leaking to Hyoi, I felt something was wrong. No, I felt something was wrong, and I told you to look into it. Against my better judgment, I started reading her notes, because I convinced you to! To see what I can learn about the dreams. I always thought her theories were just the ravings of a madwoman, but now... <sighs> well, the investigation's still underway, as you can see. Yeah, I'd like to help. This infuriates me that I just completely forgot all my previous interactions with her. Tell you what, if you can keep the investigation going on your end, I'll share what I've found. Two minds are always better than one, especially when it comes to dealing with something as abstract as dreams. <sighs> Imbued hermetic fetish. Let me 
these fetishes are, I guess, pretty cool. Damn, what about you? Yeah, it's that same dude. I'm sure he'll tell me his name in a second. Good evening, my friend. I hope it's been a pleasant one. Bad worse. Indeed, with so much misery and pain only meters away, permeating the walled city, worse is a quality that is quite tangible here in Hyoi. I do not envy those trapped within those boundaries. My name's Algernon Halfdream, and it's a pleasure to meet your acquaintance. <sighs> you don't sound like a local. Sounds like you've been in both Seattle and Berlin. No, I'm not, I admit, though I have been to Hong Kong many times in the past. I was acquainted with Meow's... Meow? Is that Crafty Shoe's name? Meow, Meow's mother, Eleanor. I must say, it's been kept in wonderful condition, if not improved somewhat. Uh, yeah, I can't place your accent. What is your accent supposed to be? I've been traveling my entire life and rarely stay in one local, lo in one local for long, in one locale for long. I would consider nowhere and everywhere my home. When you speak as many languages as I do, it's inevitable that they begin to bleed together. Well, I've always had a particular fondness for Cantonese. It has a lyrical quality few other languages can match. Um, have you been in the walled city? No. I have looked around outside and spoken to some of the residents who trade at the edge, but I have not entered it. The misery and hopelessness of those within it is overwhelming, and I would prefer not to venture too near such a well of negativity. But those emotions have colored and warped astral space in a unique fashion, one that I felt was worth studying, albeit from afar. Such a waste of human potential to think of all the ways the world and fate have failed those people. I'll see you later. I actually don't want to talk to you. get our money? Do we have to go talk to... Dr. Shenyang? Sure. What up, Doc? Dr. Shenyang greets you in the name of all producers. How'd the shindig go? Um, I've got the info. As you, you explain the night's events from start to finish, Shenyang's face grows more and more incredulous until finally his mouth is left hanging halfway open. He slowly places the cigar in a nearby ashtray and shakes his head in disbelief. Vampires in the trade industry? A vampire queen, no less? What a nightmare. At least you got me Wong, and poor Neville's show is dead. That's something. All right, kid, I'll send payment to your matrix drop. You earned it. Damn right I did. No, glad to be of help. Oh. Oh, Neville's calling. What? Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe Neville's not that bad anyways. I know this is probably just Vampire Lady's influence, but... He seems pretty. He seems actually like a better dude than Shen Yang here, but huh? Yeah, I actually, completely agree with this novel, dude. Let's see, how much money do we have? Uh, not much. Let's take another job and get some resto. Oh, 
Oh. You enter the trawler to find your crew gathered together waiting for you. Isabel has her head buried in her PDA. The rest of them stand watching her, trying to be patient. Uh, yeah, Isabel, looks like you have something to tell the class. I've been doing my homework on Josephine Sang and Sang Mechanical Services. Spill it. Okay, smoke him if you got him, because there's a lot to go over. In 2011, Sang Med Mechanical Services was a D-level corp, floundering in the shallow end of the Hong Kong corporate pool. That's when Josephine Shui married into the family. Josephine thought big. She conceived of a massive project that would catapult TMS into the big time. Something she called the Prosperity Project. Prosperity. That's what Raymond was mumbling about. Uh, so, let me just, based on the name, I'm going to assume Prosperity Project is like sucking all the positive energy out of the Kellenwald city so that they can have it like in whatever fancy other place. And that's why, no matter what, like, we seem to do, the key in, in Kowloon Walled City is so shit. But who knows? I'm hoping that she'll explain. What is the Prosperity Project? Once upon a time in the 1900s, the Walled City was a densely populated slum. Something like 30,000 people crammed into six and a half acres. Yeah, I've heard this story before. It's a shithole. Hell on earth. Yada, yada, yada. It's today's walled city, the second walled city. The first walled city started life well over a hundred years ago and lasted through both world wars and almost through the awakening. It was torn down in 1994 when the government had finally had enough. It had become such a haven for criminals that the cops would only enter in large, well-armed groups. Sounds familiar. In 2021, Josephine Tsang pr proposed a vision for a new type of low-income housing project, the Prosperity Project, a self-contained, low-cost, walking neighborhood for the poor, but on a grand scale. The Prosperity Project would give Hong Kong's poor and the flood of refugees pouring into the country a place they could call their own, something that felt more permanent than the sprawling tent city that spontaneously sprang up after the first walled city was demolished. The Prosperity Project would replace the tent city and would be symbolically built onto the site of the old walled city. The slogan was, a place of dignity where prosperity begins. The apartments weren't much bigger than the space you'd get in your average coffin motel, but they were built around plazas and marketplaces that contained goods and services catering to the poor. The government forgot the lessons of the last walled city. They loved the idea of containing the refugees and the poor to only a few densely populated blocks. It kept them out of the public eye. Securing the contract catapulted Sang Mechanical Services' fortunes ahead. It eventually put Josephine Sang onto the Executive Council. Yeah, how'd she get so powerful by building a slum? It's a very big slum. Apparently, that was also the beginning of a series of lucrative building contracts that propelled TMS into the big time. And where's Raymond coming to all this? Raymond Black doesn't come into it at all, but Edward Sang does. Who's that? That's your foster father's real name. Raymond Black was actually Edward Tsang, the only son of Josephine and her late husband, Breakwater Tsang. Really? Breakwater? Who's named Breakwater? Edward was in charge of laying the groundwork for the walled city. Excavation and utilities, running the power lines, sewage, that kind of thing. So our secret foster grandmother's trying to kill us. <laughs> Sure. This doesn't make any sense. Remember that massive gray water leak that flooded the basement back in 48? Yeah, remember what happened to Miss Maloney? <laughs> you mean her feet? They swelled like three times their normal size. Yeah, thanks for bringing back that memory. <laughs> But think about it. Did Raymond have any idea how to fix it? No. 
Ray didn't know the first thing about sewer lines. He hired a small army of plumbers, probably paid him double what the job was worth to fix the thing. It took almost two months to get the leak under control. And just when you put him in charge of utilities? No wonder the walled city smells like that. I don't think Raymond had anything to do with the utilities in the walled city. So if this man was not in charge of the utilities for the project, what was he doing down there? I don't know, but Edward Sang disappeared from the public eye shortly after Prosperity was completed, around 2031. That's about the time he moved to Seattle, around seven years before he found us. But what happened in the walled city? And what would make Raymond want to go back in there now, after all these years? I don't know. I intend to find out. Let's get a job. Job, 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 job. Inbox. Whoa! A lot of stuff in the inbox. Urgent problem. From Bao Jun. We have... Oh, that's Strangler Bao's real name. We have a problem to solve. It's urgent. Meet me at the Mahjong parlor. Kindly's orders. From Kindly Cheng. I'm not in Hyoi right now, so don't bother coming to see me. We'll talk when I return. Please continue with our business ventures in the meantime. And another from Kindly Cheng. I hope you're enjoying your newfound success in the shadows. I've got another job for you. One that should prove very lucrative indeed. I've been contacted by an employee of the Eastern Tiger Corporation. And he needs you to steal some research data and biological samples from his employer. The man's name is Tigoth Wright. Until recently, he was a researcher on a genetic engineering project. He was cagey with the details, but I gather that it centered around phenotypic... Pheno, phenotypic? Typic? Phenotype. I don't know. I don't know. Phenotypic. That's what I'll say. Alteration and postnatal genetic enhancement. Unfortunately for Wright, he's got a conscience. Stupid man. Luckily for us, he's willing to pay to have his conscience assuaged. Wright's project has apparently, was apparently quite horrible. Experiments on living children, total disregard for biomedical ethics or safety, and when Wright raised concerns, he was taken off the project. He has decided to step outside the bounds of the law and expose their wrongdoing to the world. The snag, you see, is that his wife and child live in Seoul. Not quite the heart of Eastern Tiger's power, but close enough. He is afraid if he releases information as himself, They'll be taken prisoner and used as leverage. They should have thought of that before, and that's not our problem. The samples and data are currently on an Eastern Tiger cargo ship, the MV Nalchi, sailing near Hong Kong on their way to Seoul. The storm slowed the ship down, so you don't have to go right away, but don't take too long. Once you have the data and samples, you've got to call right. I've attached his number. He'll give you instructions on how he wants information leaked. When you're ready, let me know. I'll arrange transit with Captain Jomo. He's a local Loho Joa pirate and smuggler. But don't let that put you off. He's as good as they get. And he'll have you on that ship without an instant. Yeah, let's, let's take it. Sweet. Open jobs. Claim payment data. Uh, I was hoping for more, more, more money than that. What's this restaurant job? Um, oh, okay, I have the Talon. You are to kidnap Rooster Low. And and we at least theoretically can keep the run quiet, so we should take Dunk. Yeah, let's take it. Let's just accept all these jobs. Oh, this was the stealthy thing, right? Where we have to go in and um, 
frick around with the feng shui at that this place. Okay, so we disrupt the feng shui in the offices subtly, and then we go to the roof and really make a huge mess. Yeah, I can do that. I don't want to destroy a rooftop garden, but I'll do it. Let's get our pay data. Okay, that's more than I was expecting, so that's good. Uh, so we have three active jobs, and it sounds like Strangler Bow has maybe another for us when we get to um, the parlor. It said urgent, but I'm going to do these other jobs first. I'm hoping that's not actually urgent. Because I need the money, and I'm figuring that strang the Strangler Bow thing will actually continue the main plot line. I'd rather get some money and level up my stuff a bit first. Oh, what have I what have I done? Yeah, so I still only have two um inventory slots. How do I get more? Do I need to increase my strength? Yeah, additional weapon slot. Uh, we could spend just a couple of close combat points to get that, I guess. Or... Ranged combat. And we don't... I actually plan on using either of those. We have to spend less points if we go to close combat. We spend five points to get another weapon slot, and then we could take, like, a crappy cyber deck around with us, in addition to our drones. Are those the only ways to get more slots? Let me look up, see if there's a way to get more weapons. Because I just need three, I don't need four. I'm thinking that, like, we should get a, another slot at some point, just naturally, just like we seem to get another AP naturally as the game progresses. I do want that other slot, but maybe maybe I should wait till I can actually like, afford a deck anyways. <laughs> because I probably can't right now. We'll see. I'll just keep in back in mind, I can spend five points in melee combat. Okay, so I have all this. Awesome. As you pass in front of the walled city, something... Oh, this is the same... Yeah, this is the same frickin' thing. Okay. Uh, let's ask Duncan what he thought of that last job. Helping a vampire? Why would we do that? Her -da 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 -da. <sighs> what do I think about it? Let me ponder that for a second. We crash into a fancy party, disturbed the one who's disturbed the who's who of the Hong Kong tritio scene, and fought a vampire. But you took it upon yourself to help that vampire become a vampire queen. That was an interesting choice. Not what Doc Shen Yang would want. What does he know? He's the only guy that's paying us. 
Anyway, enough about that. Need anything else? Yeah, that wasn't very helpful. Later, later, man. Uh, do, 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 do. We have some money. We have a couple of jobs to take. Let me see what sort of drones are available still. We could talk more about some medicine. My medicine? I can't think of a thing to think to talk about except how nice it is to see you. Nothing but blue skies over here, beautiful. Um, be real with me, dude. Baby, I'm as real as the setting sun. Uh, all right, beautiful. All right. His expression goes slack and shoulders slump. Matthew struggles to maintain eye contact as a slow tide of melancholy washes over his face. Hi, the plague. Well, here we are. Those B-tails aren't good for you, man. They're better than this. I know what people think. Some people like Ambrose don't look down on me. But everyone else... I just want them to leave me alone. I want to be left alone, okay? Hmm. Yeah, it's okay, friend. That's fun. Thanks, the plague. I know what I'm doing. I'm going back now. Yeah, I mean, this doesn't seem to be hurting anyone. Let's just leave him be about it. I don't... I don't know why I brought it back up. Hey, the plague! That was real, I mean, real beautiful. You've got some chops on you. Woo! You know something I think about, may I tell you? It's gonna blow your socks. You're a peach, beautiful. So let's get real, really real. I'm not Matthew Shun. I'm not Cool Blue Jazz. I'm both. I think a lot about where I'm from. Some coked up dude on a sim rig, recording his feelings, mass produced in a factory, shipped out like a commodity. And this other poor guy on a slowly sinking, gasoline reeking drone lot, called the Merchant of Poverty by his neighbors, alone with his drones, the moldy smell of his trailer. It makes me angry, the plague, angry about this heartless shit heap that calls itself meta humanity. It also makes me proud. Where are you going with this? I'm proud because I'm more than the sum of my parts. Whatever aimless tweaker my feelings come from, they merge with the guy who never had that chance, and they alleviate his pain. I live a life of honor. I'm like a knight errant. A... A this. Yushia. I'm like the swordsman of Zhao Da... Of this other thing. Fuck, I can't pronounce these things. I fight for humanity. Thanks for reaching out to Matthew. Don't you worry, I'm watching out for him. As long as there's chips, I won't get tired. I'll never leave. Let's get back to it, beautiful. Yeah, we understand each other. Oh, again, a karma frat? Yeah, let's look at these drones. Still the same stuff, but maybe I'll pick up a couple of these. Um, I think we can pick up some medical supplies as well. There's Captain Jomo if we want to do the pirate thing. But I don't think I do. I think both the other jobs sound more interesting. Let's get some medical supplies from the dock. I 
Oh, what's up, dude? What are you selling? Oh, yeah, let's talk about reliable math here. Sounds like he's in bad situation with his suppliers. Oh. Huh. Now what's this deal? Okay. Yeah, that is depressing. Yeah, give me give me some stuff, man. A Raptor. Show me your services, please. Medical supplies. Just one of these? Yeah, okay, that looks good. Um, sort of cyber work can we get? Could get a cool arm. Tailored pheromones. Ooh, I would love that. Maybe, uh, maybe we'll save up for some pheromones. I love to be smelly. Uh, so let's see, feng shui or kidnapping or rooster. Also, we have a bunch of cars to spend. Let's spend it. Okay, that'll be another AP for our drones. Awesome. And wait, did that change the... Uh, level drone we can use? I wasn't even paying attention. It might have. No, it didn't. Next, next level we can get S tier drones. Let's kidnap Rooster Low. I don't think we'll need Isabel for this. So I'm not going to take him. I'll take Duncan. Hmm. I'll take Raptor. Raptor. And got it. 
I, I would like to take Gaichu. But we'll just do this for now. Yeah, that way we have a healer with us too. A tangle of marine decorum, restless lights and ambrosial scents mingle atop a floating quay to accent the Shangri-La, Aberdeen Harbor's premier dining location. With competitive views of the surrounding bay, the restaurant attracts a steady crowd of tourists and Wuxing personnel. The primary money man for the 289s, Chung Sing Rooster Lo, is enjoying a rare meal outside of triad-held territory. Intel says he is set up in one of the restaurant's private dining rooms, but he is not alone. The rooster keeps a personal bodyguard, a notorious orc called the Talon, in addition to his regular security detail. You've seen photos of the Talon's handiwork, bodies so battered it's hard to tell where one bruise ends and the next begins. Your mission, locate rooster, extract him from the Shangri-La, and deliver him to your client alive. Simple, fast, low profile. Of course, even the simplest of runs can go sideways. Alrighty. Uh, so let's give Ractor more drone repair kits. Gobbit, here's a med kit, here's a mummy. Dunk, here's a flashbang. We, we good? Gobbit still can't use wild name. All right. It's an impressive looking security guard. Welcome to the Shangri-La. We strive to provide our patrons with an exquisite dining experience. If you have any questions or require special accommodations, don't hesitate to speak to our staff. In a small crowd. Most of our weekday business is confined to the private rooms upstairs, corporate affairs, and such. Please keep in mind that any disturbances will be promptly de-escalated by our security. We reserve the right to bar service to unruly patrons. Thank you, and enjoy your meal. Thanks. I like how he shuffled out of the way. That crab was truly amazing. I just wish I didn't have to wait an hour to get it. They do look understaffed. Oh, well, welcome to the Shangri-La, ma'am. Our hostess will see you as soon as she gets back. You're welcome to wait in the lounge. This will only take a second. Absolutely, ma'am. What is it you need? How's business? As always, we're very busy, but I see a couple of parties preparing to leave, so you won't have to wait long for a table. If you decide to wait in the lounge, please be aware that a group of our preferred Wuxing diners are celebrating inside. We'd appreciate it if you'd respect their privacy. Awesome. Let's just wait for Target. Can't believe they're late again. So everyone's complaining about how late the services are. We could go talk to Chef or Henry. Let's save. Uh, who the hell are you, Henry? A well-dressed man sits alone at the bar, elbows propped atop the counter. His face is hard, eyes blank. He swirls the contents of his half-empty glass as if in a stupor. Between the swollen eyes and whiskey double, it isn't hard to guess his mood. As you approach, he rubs his temples and graces you with a lazy, sideways glance, mumbles under his breath. Yeah, now I can dig myself any deeper. You a rough day, dude? Hmm? He looks at you again through dull, bloodshot eyes, but his gaze drifts elsewhere before returning to his drink. Lost two contracts, missed a third. Late for a meeting and publicly shamed by my coworker. 
All during the 9 to 5. New record, far as I can tell. At least I got that going for me. How'd you lose your contracts? Wish I knew. One was almost a done deal. But for some reason, the client suddenly changed their tune, and the contract slipped away before I could officially close it. The other two were for ongoing clients, people I'd worked with for years, but I somehow forgot about their annual renewal date, and a more diligent coworker picked them up. I got no credit for the long-term partnership with those clients. If anything, I now look worse for losing them, even though I brought them into Wuxing in the first place. That's a lot of uh, coincidences. You kidding me? Everyone's at each other's throat in this business. Yeah, I'm serious. They might work when extra hard pressed. The newcomer, David. Him. He came out of nowhere and has become a rock star with the upper management. He's been making connections and deals like a Wuxing veteran. Like me. It's definitely up to no good. You're telling me. You want to know what I think? I think he's got family connections, people in high places, and he's been using them to his advantage. I don't know. Just a thought. You might be on to something. Am I going to start a fight here? That's what I'd like to do, I guess. Oh. I'm going to find out. So there's David. Disgusting. Let's go talk to the chef real quick. Ooh, can we order food? And a open program tracking food orders and their respective tables flickers steadily on the computer screen. Accu served from Renraku Shangri-La restaurant. Servers notes. Inside this file is a series of notes on guests and the restaurant operations. Scroll through today's notes. Several servers have written about their concerns regarding tonight's lack of security. And a couple are frustrated with the curious guests wandering up to the second floor's private dining rooms. Interesting. A list containing dozens of orders pops up. Only a handful are for the upper floor's private dining rooms. One note on a second floor order stands out. Mmm, diner's allergic to shellfish. Floor 2, private room 3. Shrankala prawns. Interesting. Okay, that's Talon's allergy. I don't know how we exactly know that, but... Managers notice. Nothing but your typical wage slave directives in here. There are a few mentions of curtailing recreational activities in storage rooms and outer decks. One can only infer the meaning of said activities. Further down, a note in red expressly warns that the special guest on floor 2 should be served by approved wait staff only. And if the guest orders are botched again, there will be significant and widespread consequences for all servers. Okay, I need a server's code. Maybe they can hire us as a server. A heady aroma of spices and sweat bombards your senses. As the cooks move through the kitchen, scents churn in their wake. Some sharp, some sweet, some altogether unfamiliar, but all delicious. The chef barks an order to his assistant, searing fish, then whirls around, muttering fervently to himself. He stops short once he notices you, standing in his kitchen. I told them I need an extra server, not a hobo. Shoo. Okay, okay. I'm the new server here. Let's save. We'll talk to David, then we'll talk to the waitress. Maybe we can help him out. David's all smiles. He's just finished a joke to the uproarious laughter of his party. Hello, friend. Trying to get in on this joviality? You're welcome to join us for the next round. His words bleed into each other. This isn't his first drink. What are we celebrating? My recent successes. Through some hard work and a little businessly persuasion. 
you know, I sealed two contracts and a third's on the way. As convenient. Excuse me, what are you implying? Well, your co-worker over there lost two contracts today and is about to lose a third. Opposite of your situation, and on the very same day, too. Hmm. Did Henry tell you I stole his contracts? <laughs> That's illegal, you realize. He's just angry he didn't have the wits or motivation to keep those clients under his payroll. He sure did say that. <laughs> that delusional louse. I'll make sure he never slanders my hard work again. Fight, fight, fight! Henry and David stand inches from one another, both men wearing the fiercest expressions they can muster. Their hatred's almost palpable. How their confrontation will play out is unclear, but one thing is certain. You have a great seat. Spit flies from David's mouth, and his words tear through the room. You little worm! Can't keep up at work, so you try to save face by spreading baseless rumors about me. Pathetic. I have no idea what you're talking about, but I do know that you've been acquiring my clientele unfairly. And I'll tell all who will listen just what kind of a man you are. A thieving shit stain. I'm going to make you eat those words, but I'll be damned if the Shangri-La bans me for thrashing a worthless glitch like you on their property. So we'll do this outside. I'll be waiting. Uh, so I'm not sure what that accomplished. Optional create diversion outside of restaurant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we need a waiting code. Maybe we do need to ask her about Mr. Lowe. Oh, that hard-working matrix like yourself is good with faces. You certainly remember me. He travels with a big orc with a nasty scar. I might know the orc if, uh, if he's who I'm thinking of. He only comes around a couple times a year. I've never served him. But I've heard he gets real pushy with the other waiters. He's allergic to shellfish, I think. We had so many orders. Sometimes mistakes are made. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, I already know where he's eating. He's table three, right? Ooh, a security guard. Sorry, ma'am, this area's off limits. Security's got the area closed down to contain a situation on the docks. No gawking. This is the Wuxing employee patio, reserved for Wuxing customers and their guests. General public's not admitted. Why don't you head back to your table? There's ample seating in the main dining room. Huh. What good does any of that do? What if I am the new server? Will you let me work here, dude? Oh. Aren't you Yan Lung So? Word of your magnificent cuisine has spread even as far as Seattle. It's an honor to meet you in person. Ah, a fellow epicure. I suppose I can make time for a fan all the way from... Where is it, you said? Seattle? Quite the trip you've made. What is it you need, ma'am? Hmm.
I'm told one of guest has a shellfish allergy. Um. Oh. Why would this dude go along with any of this? This doesn't make any freaking sense. What? You can't possibly be saying what I think you are. You want me to poison a diner? You're deranged. I'm calling security. Hmm. Yeah, haven't you noticed the lack of guards? I've no doubt Wushing's aware I'm here. It's as if they want a certain someone out of the way. Are you going to disappoint them? Wrong- Oh, yes! We got an achievement! Wrong order. Heck yeah. So now, what, our only choice is to wait for target? What's the point of this diversion outside? I don't understand. Yeah, I don't actually know what we're supposed to do right now. Let me save and then we'll wait for target. Yeah, I'll grab a drink. The minutes tick away as we mull over a cold one. The rooster should be here any time now. What the hell was that? Chef, we have a problem. A big problem. Cut the drama, Cork Mage. We're working here. We've got a fight out front in a sick diner. And you're still here glazing dumplings? Our second floor guest is pissed. Has have security spewing up prawns and looking for someone to blame. Better brace yourself for a mouthful of fists. Okay. Looks like it's our time to go save the chef. A howl and several thumps catch the cooking staff's attention. Apprehensive glances are tossed around the kitchen. Their fear abruptly confirmed as a huge orc bursts into the room. The jagged scar on the orc's cheek matches your client's description of the talon. Or it would, if the town's face weren't a lumpy, swollen, seeping mess. <laughs> the Talon's face flushes in anger, or perhaps as a side effect of his allergy, and he raises a knobby finger to the room. What's wrong with this place? His swollen lips spit more saliva than sound. Ex excuse me, sir, you're holding the kitchen up. If you have any questions or concerns, speak to our host up front. I've got a concern, all right. A concern regarding this shithouse you call a restaurant. This is the third time you slopheads have fucked up my order. If I'm regularly forced to choke down your garbage, I expect, at the least, some substitutions to be followed. No shellfish. Get it right, or next time someone's gonna end up a whole lot worse than maimed. And you call me short-fused. Maybe now you'll think twice before ragging on me when things heat up. Yeah, I'll never stop ragging on you, Dunk. Hey, if the talent's down here, that means he's left upstairs unguarded. Uh, I mean, yeah, but this lady's not gonna just let us walk through here, right? Okay. Okay, she is. That's weird. Game saved. Uh, so I'll guess it's this one door that's open. Hello there. Inside the private dining room, you're immediately greeted by the piercing stare of two massive dragon statues. The flickering lights are just bright enough to illuminate their bronze bodies. They affect an eerie illusion of slithering scales. Across the room stands your target, Chung Sing Rooster Low. Hands trembling at his sides. 
A single, anxious guard stands near the door. Something has them on edge. The talent is missing. Who are you? What do you want? Um, if you'll please come with me, we can make this easy. I've come to deliver you to my client. Joe, where's the Talon? Where's the rest of my security? <sighs> Never mind, just get this street tramp out of here. No talent, no backup, all alone. You must really like your boss. <laughs> Not exactly, no. You can probably hear you say that, my dude. You can't get fired. Oh, okay. I'm getting out of here. Now come with me, rooster. I'm here to take you alive. Why is he so desperate? I'm here to take you alive, man. Listen, Seattle, we may have Rooster, but these stiffs were probably just a handful of his guards. We could have more downstairs. We can't leave the same way we came in. If we're going to get out of here in one piece, we need to find a new exit route fast, and I'm betting this chicken guy knows one. Hmm. Yeah, that's probably right. Rooster's teeth are clattering inside his head. His frame shakes uncontrollably. The realization that he's at your mercy with no one left to defend him is setting in. Tell me where the back door is, I'll let you keep your teeth. It, it's just outside of this room, to the right, but it's locked. I'm guessing you know a way to open it. Y yes, I do. I'll take that. Cool. Come in with me, dude. Unknown caller. The Plague, is this your channel? He was asking. My name's Paylon. I'm your getaway driver. We have details to discuss, but well, let's keep it brief. Time's ticking. I'm at the loading dock across the bridge from the restaurant's main entrance. Big old schooner. Can't miss me. But neither will the HKPF, who I've just learned are on their way here in response to a security call. Uh, shit. One last thing. I may be the driver, but this ain't my rig. Door's locked and I don't know the code. You may have to break in. Good luck and get moving. What? Okay. Save. So I guess we would have been too lucky to get out of this without even getting into a combat. So we have to protect the rooster. And access the docking bay. I guess we don't have to protect the rooster, but we should. Uh, who are these guys? I guess there's people who are going to fight us. Uh, can I not just hop into like one of these rowboats and paddle away? A pair of triad gangsters block your path. My man, help me! You free me. Get, a get me away from here and I guarantee you'll be rewarded. Nunyan, favors, power, whatever you want. Actually, we're liking the position we're in now. You begging at our feet. The idea that maybe once you're gone, we can move up the chain. Okay. You know, Rocco here is plenty qualified to take your seat. In fact, we might as well make sure you don't make it out of here alive. No, why? I can, I can make you rich, I... Oh, man. Let's not make a scene. No ink, no suits. You one of them runners? Great. OK. 
Okay. So these are trad goons. I don't particularly care about their personal safety. Raptor, get over here. Oh, let's take a look at Coach Jay. He looks the same. Awesome. Gobbit, can you please haste uh, my boy Dunk? Duncan, can you get all the way there in time to subdue this fellow? No. Oh, he's not... Oh, he's not fully stunned. Well, that sure as hell sucks. Okay, next turn we'll put that guy in cuffs. Uh, sundowner. Uh, who the hell are you? Oh, <laughs> yeah, you can just stay in the back, I guess. We will protect. Why do you throw a grenade when your buddy's right there? What a dumbass. You're under arrest. Under arrest for wasting my time. Okay, drum buddy, please go find us a way in here. Oh wow, nice. No, why did- Duncan. I'm disappointed. Oh shit, I don't have a Decker. I think I needed one for this, so...
also got it. I'm assuming you can't just open this door because we need that code, right? Uh, Gobbit ascends it. Sure. A two, four, five, and something that feels vague like a nine. Two, four, five, nine. Oh, but I don't know the order. Oh, who the fuck are you? Oh, no. Talon, I'm over here. I've got weapons trained on me. Can't move. Save me and we'll get out of here. Take this incident straight to the top. They'll herald our survival. Reward us. You little shit dragging me to this restaurant over and over. Make me eat filth or watch your stuff your goddamn face full of it. And now here you are. Turn traitor in a blink. Y you can't speak to me that way. You're beneath me. I'm still a red pole. And when the triad comes for me, I'll see you flayed for those words. Huh. You won't get shit from the two A nines. In fact, if you new allies don't gut you, the triad will. Make sure you don't go squawking to anybody about high-level plans or secrets or whatever. A fool like you won't last the night. Talon, Johnny, please. Please help me. It wasn't all bad, right? We had some good runs, you remember. Does he have a rocket launcher? What is he holding? Fuck. Okay. Oh no, and Big Mama's out here too. Howie. Oh boy. That's a lot of goons. Okay, so Gobbit is very much busy. You get behind cover. We'll protect you from harm. Raptor. Damn it. Um, holy hell. We can arrest the town. Oh, we can't arrest him? Is he immune to it? Oh, I wasted my beanbag on him. So let's punch this guy. Pissed off and needs someone to punch. for wear, but... What's my stupid lens not working? Okay. Uh, what is our thing? Optional kill the talent. So maybe we will kill the Talon, and I'll just arrest these other guys. Jeez, there's so many. Really? 
miss. Where you head? Achievement, little helpers. Drones are my little helpers, I guess. I have another flashbang. Well, one of you at least. Police are on their way here too, so we're gonna have a hell of a time if Gobbit can't get through uh, soon. next round, but you can go punch this guy in the face. Or not. Beanbag him in the face. No! How did you miss from point blank? That guy's hard to hit. Please don't kill me. Okay, done. You can do this one. Slap him in irons. Uh, Reactor, you have a med kit. Heal me. You can't heal me. You don't have enough AP. Uh, Sundowner, you can heal me. Thanks, bro. here so you can make an arrest. Let's put our drones away because hopefully Gobbit will finish what she's doing. Oh, Gobbit did finish. Gobbits out of there with our target. Kidnap was successful. I still showed him a sleeping thing on him. Uh, Dunk, forget about him. Escape.
better actor. Oh. Uh, okay, next turn you'll get out, Dunk. Awesome. The boat sways languidly atop the water. Insulated walls stifle outside noises, as if the chaos just beyond the door belonged to another world. Its interior is cramped, made smaller by maritime equipment protruding from the walls. The scent of sea and moldering wood dominates your senses, ripened from years of perfunctory cleaning. Finally, a safe place to rest. <sighs> the 289s are going to jam you up for this. Doubt it. Worst you'll get is dead. Worst we'll get is a finger waggle. But so long as that hand is also holding our knee in, we're in a good position. Can you say the same? Now things aren't gonna look good for you, Mr. Love. The boat heaves and pitches over the bay as your driver plows through the choppy waves to the drop-off point, leaving the Shangri-La restaurant far behind. Inside, restlessness fills the cabin. You finish the job, the extraction was a success, and now your client awaits his prize, the Triad Red Bull Rooster. It wasn't easy. It should have been. It would have been, if that damned Talon hadn't mangled your plans with his visceral determination. But even a streets forged orc like Talon could be stricken down. With the Talon dead, your escape from the restaurant to the getaway boat was made smoother. Well, as smooth as wading through a small army of triads and skirting the HKPF dragnet could be. Luckily, Rooster got through the pursuit unharmed, and with the Talon now permanently out of commission, you might earn a few extra nuyen from your client. All in all, a good run. Nice. Uh, so we need claim payment. Awesome. Uh, let's see if we got any metadata to give law here. Mm. Yeah, were you guys just talking about me? The plague! What's going on? What have you been up to? Don't worry, T-Zero's a Wampoan. He's so cool, he's like refrigerant. So what can I hook you up with today? Here's some metadata. Awesome. Um, sweet. I don't know why I'm collecting all of these programs. I still can't deck yet. Uh, I wonder if I have enough um, money to buy a deck. Jobs. Payment. Okay, that's an okay payment. We're going to do this Geomantic Sabotage next, I think. Let's see how everyone else is doing. Oh my god, go up the stairs. How are you doing, Isabel? I guess not. What about you, Gob? Yeah, what are your thoughts on the last run? Never had a chance to go to Shangri-La before. Too ritzy for a street rat like me. 
And you know what? I'm kind of okay with that. All those stuffed shirts and fancy food are nice, but give me a cheap corner stall any day. I did pocket some of their silverware, though, and a teapot. How did you pocket a teapot? The Talon guy was a real piece of work. Glad to see that guy put in the ground. He made my skin crawl, like he was the kind of guy who would torture animals for fun. Even the 289 seemed a little scared of him. I doubt anybody's going to shed tears over him for too long. Huh. Alright. Out here on the big Texas. What about you? Rector's shop is sweltering hot, even more so than it was the first time you stepped inside. The whir of actuators accompanies the fine motions of the manipulator arms that hang over the ceiling. They're turning an object over and over in their articulated hands, soldering wires and hammering rivets. Ah, my friend, welcome back. Rector touch types with a series of commands into his racer, and the arms relax into an idle posture. He smiles at you, a cigarette dangling from his lip. There, that's better. Now what can I do for you? Uh, yeah, how are you getting along with everyone? Perfectly well, thank you. They all seem competent enough, and there haven't been any major personality conflicts so far. So long as they continue performing to an acceptable standard, I can see no reason not to continue our arrangement. It's good to run with the team again. Yeah, what do you think of them all? Uh, they're fine, I suppose. All fine. Gobbit is quite charming. Isabel keeps to herself, and Duncan's doing his best in a bad situation. Guy Chu is quite intriguing. I'm very pleased that the team's willing to overlook his unfortunate condition. Many in the shadows wouldn't be. Hmm. What are your thoughts on the last one? A reasonably pleasant outing. We had a nice stroll, took in the night air, went to a gaudy restaurant, and took a man into custody against his will. As jobs go, I've had worse. Huh. Between my ears and... Nizhny Novogorod and my time here in Hyoi, I've spent a year in the free city of Berlin. That was where I got my feet wet as a shadow runner, you see. I ran with a team of anarchists for a time, and learned the ropes of the occupation under their tutelage. Now what can you tell me? A good group of people, disorganized to be sure, but capable. Sadly, we're no longer on the best of terms. An opportunity arose, and I seized it. In so doing, I left Berlin for Hong Kong, and I did so without much notice. My absence made life difficult for them, and they blamed me for their hardships. Huh. I mean, that... Hmm. That does seem like a lot what our main character did to Duncan and Raymond, so I don't think we can really judge much on that. Yes, that's right. While my departure may have caused complications for my former teammates, it wasn't personal. I've, I haven't lost any sleep over my decision. In my position, any of them would have done the same. Ultimately, I would say my time in Berlin was quite educational. Different from my earlier right life in Russia, to be sure. As I said, the experience was invaluable. Ultimately, though, he is probably better suited to my sensibilities. Really? Life in Hong Kong is more structured than it is in Berlin. Things don't make sense here, or things do make sense here in a way that the Flux State didn't. I have an orderly mind, everything that's placed, neatly labeled and filed away. This approach is what allows me to make sense of the world. To say that the people I knew in Berlin thought differently 
would be an understatement. Yeah, what sort of opportunity made you move here anyways? When we first met, I told you that I parted ways with Grecian Aviacor under unfortunate circumstances, yes? These same circumstances led me to Berlin. I was wronged, and I would not find recourse in Russia. I suppose there's no sense in being vague. I'll tell you the story if you want to hear it. You may remember the self-repair system I mentioned the first time we met. The module that would allow Ghostshire or any sufficiently equipped drone to repair itself. I told you my research had been lost. That was not strictly true. It was stolen by a pair of colleagues who I had long considered friends. They were researchers from my old lab. They turned against me, stole our work. In truth, my work, and defected. Perhaps out of desperation and ambition, they had always been fixated on getting out of Russia. Grecian Aviacor was a nationalized corporation, and they would never get rich as cogs in a government-controlled machine. In our project, they saw their key to breaking away and earning their fortunes. Never mind the fact that I was opposed to the idea. Yeah, where'd they go? Yes, the two had long spoken about moving to Berlin. Such was true of a great many academics in Russia. My homeland is a bureaucratic dictatorship, you see. There's little personal freedom, and there are many rules to be followed. As you might imagine, the stable anarchy of the Flux State can be an alluring concept to those who live under totalitarian rule. Berlin is much romanticized back home. Okay. The Flux State has rules, my friend. They aren't codified, but they most certainly exist. Should you ever travel there, you'll want to remember that. But I digress. In the hunt for my traitorous colleagues, Berlin was my only lead. I decided I would travel there. At best, I would find them, and at worst, it would be a good place to rebuild my life. Aww. It took me over a year to locate my former friends. It was a long, painstaking search, but I was nothing if not determined. I finally found evidence that they'd used my research as a bargaining chip to secure positions at Ares, and they were here in Hong Kong. We already know all this because we already like went and stole it back from them. like this is a weird conversation. So you came back here to Hyoi? I picked up and left the next day. My old team was upset to be sure. Lucky Strike in particular howled for my blood. But I know where my priorities lie. And so here I am, and here they are, and soon I'll be ready to act. I really must thank you for inviting me into the team. Your abilities will make my will be invaluable when the time finally comes to make my move. Assuming, of course, you'd be willing to help. Of course. Thank you, my friend, but this is a discussion for another day. We aren't ready to hit an Ares facility yet. There's more intelligence to gather before we make our move. When the time comes, I'll let you know. Yeah, stolen research means more than money, right? Yes, yes, much more. It was my life's work, and it was important. Reducing it to a bargaining chip was a deadly insult, both to me and to all those who would benefit from my work. said with almost religious fervor. Religious? No, religious superstition's a relic of the past. I welcome the future, a future that my research was intended to help usher in. Tell me, are you familiar with the concept of transhumanism, the transformation of humanity as a species by technological means? Sure. Yes, that's right. Transhumanism's no longer a philosophy, it's a fact. You look around you. Cybernetics are an important aspect of everyday life. Further, I would argue that the synthesis of man and machine is the crowning achievement of metahumanity as a people. Sure. 
In such a future, the capacity for unlimited self-repair would be indistinguishable from immortality. You can see, then, why the theft of my research came as such a blow. My former colleagues hadn't just stolen from me. They'd taken my contribution to the future of our species and reduced it to a bargaining chip. Yeah, I'd be upset. I was more than upset, my friend. I was livid. I still am. But all will be made right in the fullness of time. I am nothing if not a patient man. I can wait. <laughs> Again, this all information that we already know. This is weird how it's being delivered to us. So yeah, tell me about those two colleagues. Today they've called themselves Taylor and Hardingham. Those aren't their real names, obviously. They shed their former identities when they left their old lives behind. <coughs> and these two are in Hong Kong now? Yes, working for Ares Asia Holdings, ensconced away in one of their enclaves here. I'm not certain which one yet, but I'm narrowing it down. Oh, how wonderful it will be to find them. What a reunion we will have. Yeah, what was it like growing up in Russia? Tumultuous, as you might expect. You probably aren't old enough to remember the Euro Wars, but I am. I know bits and pieces, but I didn't live through it. Ah, well, the wars were formative experiences for Russians of my generation. Not traumatic, per se. Certainly not as they were for the Germans, Finns, and Poles. But important, nonetheless. My country was the instigator of the first Euro War back in 30. I remember the rhetoric, the hardships of living under a wartime economy, the rampant xenophobia that took hold. I remember how we all cheered when our forces invaded Poland. Three months later, that was all that it took for our military to crush what meager resistance the Poles could bring to bear. It was quite the source of nat national pride at home. I remember our drive into Germany and the desperate bid to reclaim the eastern portion of that country for ourselves. Just think about the symbolic significance of such an act. An audacious move to be sure, but Secretary Kropinen was determined to make history. Audacious move? Yes, that's right, and the deaths of tens of thousands of people and the destruction of infrastructure and economy of nearly 40 million others. These are impressive numbers, yes, and they represent a tragedy on a grand scale. But nations at war seldom concern themselves with such things. I believe Kropinen was more concerned with the opinions of his own people than he was with his place in the history books, and in truth, I cannot fault him for this. For the four months that the war lasted, he did bring the country together. But alas, the Night Wraith incident put an end to our march and sent our forces into full retreat. British-made fighter bombers with stealth capabilities, very state-of-the-art, very powerful. At least that's what they were purported to have been. Nobody's ever come forward to accept responsibility for the attack. Regardless of who was behind it, the result was the same wave upon wave of bombings that targeted our forces and the Germans alike, coupled with the assassinations of dozens of military leaders, a devastating, synchronized operation expertly carried out over the course of a single night. At home, viral attacks shut down our power grids. Hundreds of thousands of Russian homes found themselves without heat or electricity in the dead of winter. I remember huddling under a mountain of cheap blankets that my mother had piled up on my bed. They did little to protect me from the cold, but there was something I could hang on to. Something tangible that I associated with warmth and comfort and home. There, as my body trembled and I watched my breath frost over, a horrible truth descended upon me. We had caused this. We were the villains of the First Euro War. For the first time, I came face to face with what Kropinen's folly had brought us. And here, under that ridiculous heap of rags, I came to realize what would surely come to pass. The world thought us villains, and so they would treat us like villains. We would be pariahs on the international stage, crippled by retributive sanctions. 
we would never live down the shame. And then the AFA invaded Greece and Spain, sparking off Euro War II. We redeployed our troops to help repel them, and all was made right again. That easy, huh? About. Oh, we were still regarded with suspicion, of course, but Europe might have fallen if it hadn't been for our help. In essence, we took back our reputation at gunpoint. Not an ideal solution, but it worked. Within the span of four months, we Russians had gone from nobodies to a terrible threat to unlikely saviors in the eyes of the Western world. Studying exactly how this happened has taught me a great deal about human psychology and social dynamics. Well, at least you took something away from it. Indeed, there are lessons everywhere, if only we stop to look for them. But I've gone on for too long about this already. I must be boring you. Shall we talk about something else? Surely there are more interesting and relevant things to discuss. Hey, who are the AFA? Ah, uh, yes, I suppose you wouldn't know. They were the only active they were only active for the years surrounding the conflict, after all. The AFA was the Alliance for Allah, serving under Mullah Saeed Jazrir, a coalition of right-wing Middle Eastern governments that assembled after the failure, some say sabotage, of the United Islamic Conference. They looked to a weakened Europe and saw an opportunity, one that my country was entirely responsible for creating. So I launch a surprise attack. Yes, but in hindsight, we should have foreseen it. Ultimately, the AFA did what any hawkish power would have done in their position. I cannot fault them for taking advantage of Europe's weakened state. Given their circumstances, they would have been foolish not to. So what happened? The AFA folded in 37 after Jezreer's assassination. A lucky thing for us, too. The body count could have been a great deal higher. In the years they were active, the AFA gave us a hell of a fight. Okay, we have exhausted his dialogue. Hopefully it actually remembers that. Let's do the same for Gaichu. Uh, for things that we've already asked him, I'm just going to blaze through there so the options stop showing up. Trying to remember what we picked for like, all the options as well. Okay, this is like something we didn't ask him. We didn't ask him about growing up in a corporation. Just to, I guess he was showing us a picture. A young man, obviously Gaichu, leans against a railing which overlooks a sprawling harbor complex of skyscrapers and cranes. His school uniform is ripped and the beginnings of a black eye are forming. Abrasions cover his knuckles and blood dots his pants. Despite this, he's grinning like he's just won the lottery. Vibrant. Fierce. Look a little beat up. Ah, oh, that must be on Mount Maya. If I remember right, I gave better than I got in that fight. Three against one, but they were out of shape and cocky. I used to cause a lot of trouble when I was in school. My father was constantly raging. I had no sense of responsibility, that I needed to take life more seriously. The final straw was when he bailed me out of jail. Now we've tried uh, Raymond's patience too. That is the curse of fathers everywhere, to have their children give them ulcers, especially true for high-strung authoritar authoritarian types like Yasujiro. My friends and I stole a delivery van. It had a shipment of Shiawase Simsense decks, brand new, very expensive. We were going to fence them and use the money to take a trip to Okinawa. Are you familiar with what it's like to grow up in a corporate family? I know a little bit. 
Then you understand how it is. Children are encouraged to participate in acts of vandalism against rival corporations. Unfortunately, we were caught by Shiwase security, not Renraku. What did your daddy do? That's a story for another time, unfortunately. I still have a lot of arranging to do, and I doubt anyone else will be willing to be alone with me in a darkened room. Come back later. We can discuss it further. Sure. How about now? Um, bu -bu 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 -bu. We were talking about your father bailing out of jail. Let's keep talking about that. Ah, yes. I do recall you asking about that just moments ago. You said if I came back later, you'd tell me what happened. So, I didn't leave, and I just want to continue talking about it. Ah, I've given you my word, and I intend to keep it. Do not be concerned. I have simply not spoken of my family in a long time. Are you close? Not any longer. I have not seen my father for many years now, nor my mother or sister. I wish I could say I missed them, but I feel that I hardly know them after so many years apart. Yasujiro gave me an ultimatum after my run-in with Shiawase security. He told me he had cut a backroom deal with a rival in Shiawase to keep me out of prison. The charges would be suspended if I finished high school and studied at Kyoto University with the intent of joining Renraku. If I did not, Shiawase would take me into custody and I would spend time in prison. Typical corporate politics. Mm, that is one perspective. I prefer to think of it as a man protecting the son he loved, because his son was stupid and thoughtless. This was the act of a man harming his company to protect his family. I do not think that is a common quality in these times. I had always taken my family for granted. Raised in a Renraku family, going to Renraku schools, I always had a sense of place, of belonging where I was. The thought of all that vanishing, I simply could not imagine it. Suddenly, the reality of my actions became clear. From then on, I tried to be the son he wanted, and he seemed glad of it. We grew much closer over the next few years. He took time off to visit me when I was living in Kyoto. He was a very busy man in those days, a lot of responsibility and very little time for himself. I was impressed that he could carve off as much time as he did, just to go camping with his son. Uh, a lot of nice wilderness in that part of Japan, I bet. Very much so. The land around Kyoto is protected from development due to historical and cultural significance. Most of the mountains are considered sacred, so the Diet declared them a national preserve. We made several trips to the area between Kyoto and Nara, around the village of Ide. We camped in the mountains above it. We would hunt wild deer and boar there, using my family's antique arquebus. Why the fuck do you have, like, old-ass black powder weapons? That's a strange choice. It's a choice of expediency. It's nearly impossible for a private citizen to own a firearm in Japan. Which is why you, you may so often read of Yakuza attacks involving swords and cleavers. As the Tanakashima that my family owns is from the 18th century, it is exempt from ordinary regulations. I think I have that type of rifle in Neo. Perhaps unironically, hunting with my father is how I learned to prepare raw meat. Strange to think that such activities served as training for my current state of affairs. How do you prepare raw meat? Soak the meat in brined water and simmer it at low heat for several hours. Let it cool and repeat the process over several days. It cannot get too hot or I am unable to eat it. This process brings out the collagen in the meat. When it is done, I spice it with ginger and sancho pepper. Again, not too much. Mundane food is anathema to me. Those were the days. I'm sorry I can't go back to those times. 
When one joins the Red Samurai, one must give up all attachments of one's previous life. The company, the code, and the unit become the entirety of your world. Even family ties? Especially those. Anything that could distract you from a mission must be purged. Commitment to the unit and the company must be total. Applicants must be human, Japanese, and utterly devoted to Renraku. Your unit becomes your family. Your commander is your father and mother. Quite awkward. Your teammates, your siblings. Red Samurai are not allowed to reveal our identities and position to anyone outside of our special operations group. Even if we wanted friends outside the unit, we could not have them. Uh, what were you reading? It's called Hagakure, Hidden Leaves, written by Yamamoto Tsunetomo, as a treatise on what it means to be a samurai and how one should best serve one's lord. Required reading for the Red Samurai, unsurprisingly. Huh. Relieving... Reliving old memories? Not so much old memories as old lessons. I have many scars to remember my mistakes by, and each one seems to evoke a passage from the book. The author has a central thesis. When there is a question of life or death, always choose death. Throw oneself into the fray with no resignations and act on instinct alone. My current state of affairs speaks the truth of this more robustly than any lesson in a dojo. Hmm. That sounds a little crazy. So it seems to most in Japan as well. Most are unprepared to live by the code of Bushido. Like any special forces unit, the Red Samurai are elite. Those that cannot meet the stringent requirements are not looked down upon. They are simply not exceptional. I don't think you have to choose death to be exceptional. Of course not, but it is the center of what the Red Samurai are. Other elite units live by their own codes. For us, it is the code of Bushido, and Bushido demands that we make that choice. Sunetomo believed that to truly embody the virtues of a samurai, adherents should be mindful of, the pa of their path at all times. Never stop training, always question how one's actions reflect on their lord. Above all, be prepared to do your duty instinctively at any time, no matter the cost. Sounds dangerous. I'm certain it is, but what choice do I have? Without a cure for my condition, all, I, all that I am able to do is embrace the reality of what I have become. It does not seem like much of a choice at all to me. What would he say about your refusal to kill yourself? I suspect he would not approve of my decision. For him, a, com a commandment to take one's own life was sacrosanct, but he also had a strong belief in lords treating their retainers justly and with kindness. In practice, this was not always the case. Um, what's it like to be ghoul? Preparing for the eventuality of killing me and collecting the bounty? Make sure you leave my face intact. I would prefer to be a well-preserved trophy. Don't worry, I'll have it stuffed and mounted. <laughs> now that would be an illustrious end to my career. A severed head decorating a leaking wreck of a boat. Home that boat has a name, thank you, Big Texas. Home to extremely private individuals who will never show me off. Couldn't you sell it to a museum or something of that sort? If you wish to know about what it's like to be me, ask away. I see no reason to conceal the details of my condition. Why don't you smell like rotten meat? <laughs> Diet and cleanliness. Most ghouls eat rotten flesh and do not bathe. I eat fresh meat and bathe regularly. Are you immortal? Hmm, I have no idea. I do not believe there have been any organized studies of ghoul longevity. Most strains of the human metahuman vampiric virus impart a semblance of extended life, but I do not believe that the Krieger strain is one. Somehow, I think it is more likely I will die in combat than of old age, no matter how long I live. We should ask the doctor. 
To what end? I live by the sword and I will die by it. I have no illusions of my chances of growing old. He's a Klingon warrior. How would I live out my days? In a rural country village, eating people who happen to expire on nearby roads? That will not be my fate. What's the deal with your teeth? Is there something weird with his teeth? I don't even remember. What deal are you referring to? He doesn't know either. Oh, they're pointy. Did you file them down to those points? No, they are actually new teeth created by the infection. I suppose it is a natural advantage to have teeth better suited for carnivorous pursuits. What's it like eating people? That seems like a really fucking weird thing to ask, like rude. What is it like to eat anything else? Or for a diabetic, a, a diabetic to take insulin? It is like that, a fact of life. I have found that most people are revolted by the concept of eating the flesh of humans, rather than the act itself. Taken in isolation of social concerns, humans are no more or less edible than most mammals. The flesh can be of poor or high quality, depending on all the factors you would expect, diet, lifestyle, etc. I prefer to prepare my meals as I would sashimi, light garnish and flavoring, but with an emphasis on the taste of the base meat. Do I enjoy it? No, not especially. Some Japanese are fond of pork and chicken sashimi, but I have never been one of them. But it is a fact I must accept, and if it is how things will be, I will make the best of it. Do you feel bad about eating people? No, but I was never a vegetarian, so why should I? It does not matter where the meat comes from. Someone who died in a car accident is as viable as someone I kill. I admit I have eaten people that I have killed, but that was of necessity. I was going to kill them anyways, why let their bodies go to waste? How did you join the military? I feel like he just explained that to us. But I guess not. Ah, oh, fair question. Given my youthful indiscretions, are you familiar with the Kempeitai? No. The Kempetai are the political arm of the Japanese military, much like the commissars of the Soviet Union. They are responsible for enforcing political and social orthodoxy. This is not just within the army, mind you. They also enforce certain laws with regards to the general populace. When I was enrolled at Kyoto University, I studied global security and political science. It is the major, generally used as a gateway to private security postings with both government and corporate militaries. I knew I wanted to fight. I was a young man and my blood was always up. One of the requirements was that students join the Youth Brigade Kempeitai. The Youth Brigade is a bit like the ROTC in North America, the Young Falcons in the Sioux Nation, or the District Officer Program in the Republic of Korea. Members learn to be soldiers without actually joining an army. They perform community service and promote civic pride. Performance and prestige in the Kempeitai Kempeitai used to dictate later job opportunities, a bit like a good internship. Uh, seems like kind of thing Renraku would like. When I was in school, the mega corporations looked favory on youth brigade service. At the time, the interests of the emperor and the corporations were aligned, a grand drive to return Japanese industry to the forefront of the world economy. Good marks from your youth brigade commander were a sure sign you would be offered a good position with corporate security, and I wanted to be the best. These days, the megacorporations have begun to resist that kind of nationalism in favor of corporate pride. Youth Brigade service is becoming a black mark rather than a positive. I do not know if the alternative is any better, though. When I was nearing graduation, I was approached by a recruiter with Renraku Security. She told me I came from a good family and could have a promising career with the company. She offered to fast-track my application toward a potential Red Samurai position. Three years with the Renraku military as a junior officer and guaranteed placement in a Red Samurai training billet of my choosing. The pay was good and the excitement of being an elite was an attractive proposition. 
I accepted, but I did not truly understand what I was signing up for. As I told you before, they force you to give up everything except the company and the unit. That was made clear to me, but I did not truly understand it. Did you regret it? On the whole, no. I do not know who I would have been had I not joined. Perhaps there are things that I miss, but regret is perpetual. One is always tempted to ask what if, but that is a trap. This is who I became. The armor was my protection and my identity. The training was extremely difficult, both mentally and physically. I knew I would be isolated from my old life, but I did not anticipate the full extent of that isolation. All Red Samurai recruits report to a facility called the Forge in Chiba. You are assigned to a unit, you and four other recruits, and for the next two years the Forge will be your home and prison. It seems ridiculous in retrospect. We were all so young. None of us had any idea what we were doing, except trying to become the best soldiers in the world. Soldiers first class. And yet those strangers became my new family in the absence of the old. Uh, tell me about those members. That chapter of my life is over and done with. And are they no longer part of my world? Why would you care about any of that? Hmm. You said they became your surrogate family. That's important. Hmm. You make a wise point. Commanders should know their soldiers as well as they know themselves. Very well. When I was younger, I would have more readily cut off my fingers than tell you what you ask. You must understand that secrecy is absolute among the Red Samurai. Your identity becomes secret, erased from any database that might connect you to the Red Samurai. You use only your code name when in the field, and your given name is known only to your commanders and your unit. Even other Red Samurai units have no idea who you really are. Contact with the outside world is cut off completely. Even once training is over, your communications are restricted. Maintaining relationships outside of those you work with is frowned upon. It's a lot of stress. Very few recruits get to this point if they cannot handle it. We all underwent stringent psychological tests prior to this point. If a recruit cannot handle it, he and the rest of his unit are failed out of the program. The rationale is simple. If one member cannot take the training and his unit cannot carry him through, they have all failed. Ishida was our commander. He came from a rich family in Saitama, the kind of family where he was given every advantage possible, with the expectation he would keep the family name prestigious. He was older than the rest of us as he has already spent six years in the army, a very severe man, rarely given to humor. Takagawa was usually the second in command. As our designated marksman, he tended to have a better tactical view of how an operation should be run, simply because he needed to study the terrain more. He loved to get us laughing. Without him, I think I would have gone crazy in the first few months. Our mage's name was Sasaki. She had been in training as a Miko, an apprentice priestess, when her magic began to manifest. She was in the unit for the challenge and for the money. Her family had always been poor, and had always told her she would never amount to anything. I think she had joined the Red Samurai just to prove to them that she could do anything she wanted. It's a good attitude. I'm unsurprised to hear it. You and Sasaki share similar attitudes. Neither of you stops to consider if your goals are attainable. You simply know that they are. Our heavy gunner's name was Aomori. He kept the team honest with himself. Is that Blue Forest? Is that what that means? Or could potentially? Let me look up. Oh, that's the, the name of a prefecture. Seems like a weird thing to name someone. Okay, it means Blue Forest. There could be green forest as well. It's okay. He kept the team honest with itself. He never had disparaging words for anyone, but would not hesitate to call someone out for their behavior. Sasaki loved that about him, really. She loved all of him. 
The two were discreet, but discretion only goes so far in such a small team. Still, we respected their privacy when possible. Seems like a recipe for disaster. Under ordinary circumstances, it could have, but Red Samurai Unit Commanders are given incredible leeway in what to allow or forbid. The belief is that the unit should fail or succeed as a whole. To that end, whatever works is the guiding principle. Aomori and Sasaki would have been miserable if we kept them apart, and it would have hurt the team. Lastly, there was me. I was the close quarters and breaching expert, the first man in the door when we had to clear a room. I was the perfectionist on the team. Aomori could get us to do anything, but I was the one who made certain we did it well, with style. How do you mean? If a thing is worth doing, it is worth doing well. If that thing is also your duty, it is worth doing perfectly. Many times we would perform a drill or exercise well enough, but that was not good enough. If I had to trust my life to it. That was why we became one of the best teams in the organization's history. Yeah, there's something to be proud of. Of course it is. Do you think I do not know that? I apologize, it's just that those feelings are still raw sometimes. Even if I were to be cured, I could never go back. They have been disgraced, and I have done unforgivable things. I have been cast out for good. Are you really sure? When they ambushed me in Fukuoka, it was a fight or die. I killed two of them before I escaped. I will not be returning to the unit. No matter what. It's not an easy memory to grapple with. That's fine, man. Thank you, the plague. I'm sorry I cannot talk about it now. I need to process the emotions. They are still raw. I am tired. Come back later and we can talk more. How about now? Hello, the plague. Pardon me for continuing my exercises. I feel I've been letting them slip as of late. Worried about getting rusty? No, that's not quite it. Rather, I wish to learn to bring my enhanced strength and speed to bear. In order to do so, I must ensure that my blindness does not hinder me. Perfection is a journey, not a destination. Do you see the edge on this sword, forged by one of the finest swordsmiths in modern Japan, diamond-coated edge capable of cutting even the most hardened ceramic armors? But what good is a sharpened edge without the precision to apply it? When I was still a man, I could have cut a single pea in half with my eyes closed. Oddly, after becoming blind, I cannot replicate this feat. I think soon I will be able to perform this feat again. I simply have to train my body to ignore the senses that it no longer has and pay attention to the new ones. Now, what is it you would like to discuss? Tell me about when your own old unit amb ambushed you. Very well. <laughs> my time in Fukuoka was tense. Since leaving Keihanshin, I had been careful to stay out of sight by moving on foot or in the back of automated delivery vans. I was running out of food, however, and needed to be in a city for that. Fukuoka is just big enough to get lost in, but not so large that a ghoul sighting could go unnoticed. I hid in abandoned buildings and storm drainage systems, and for two weeks I managed to stay hidden. The strain of having to constantly move was wearing on me, however, and I made a mistake. I had to get out of Japan, but all my contacts in Fukuoka had come up empty-handed when I asked for a way to China. I was running low on money, and I could feel the team catching up with me. A contact of mine in Kumamoto owed me a favor, and arranged passage for me if I could reach the city in 48 hours. If I had taken my time, I could have made it to Kumamoto without incident, but I let caution slip when I got his email. I thought if I disguised myself, I could take the train there, get out before my unit got any closer to finding me. I still don't know how they found me. Magical tracking, perhaps, or simply a well-developed spy network. Regardless, they found me. They were waiting for me at Hakata Station. It was an ambush. That is a very public place for an ambush. 
It is. I suspect their orders were clear, however. Do whatever it takes to kill me. Civilians expendable. For units like the Red Samurai, ordinary laws do not apply. The mission's success is the only concern. I had taken steps to disguise myself as best I could, relying on the sheer number of people to conceal my presence. I suspected that the team might attack while I was in public, but I did not realize just how expendable the civilians were. Oh, one second. I have to tell Alex something. When they blew the C-4 charges over the station's western entrance just to box me in, I realized how much I had underestimated them. I assumed that the train had derailed honestly, but then I smelled the telltale acrid vapor of the explosives. Once you smell it, you never forget. The plastic explosive that we used has a particularly sharp odor, like old cheese. Something to do with an olfactory tagant. Tagant? What's a tagant? Added to help track if it is stolen. Is a tagant like a tagging agent? Is that what that stands for? I don't know. I remember stumbling through the dust and debris, trying to find my way to the rail platforms. They attacked from all sides, using the confusion to strike at once. I could hear Ishida and Takagawa behind me. Aomori and Sasaki charged out of an access corridor just ahead of where I'd been standing. Sasaki threw a firewall down behind me, cutting off retreat while Aomori started firing. That's a nasty situation. One of the worst, confined space facing a mage and a heavy gunner. Those are losing odds, even if the attackers are ordinary mercenaries. I did the only thing I could think of. I charged Aomori and Sasaki. They were only 15 meters away from me. The only advantage I had was that they were as blinded by the dust as I was, but I could still hear and smell them. Sasaki threw a lightning bolt at me, but I managed to roll under it. As I came up, Aomori's light machine gun was swiveling down. I felt time stretch out as I stared down the barrel. I caught Aomori by the throat with the tip of my sword. It was a maneuver I'd practiced hundreds of times before. There was no resistance as I cut through his trachea, and he fell as I rolled to the side. I could hear him choking for breath as he dropped. It's strange to think how clear that memory is, even now. Damn. Spare me the two new in psychiatry. Obviously what you say is true, but the memory sticks with me so strongly for another reason. It was in that strike that I realized who I truly was. My whole time with the Red Samurai, I had focused on ensuring that I was worthy of the team. Everyone felt that way, but I felt it more acutely than most. I have always wanted to be the best, the fastest, the most precise. In the Red Samurai, I felt that to be less than perfect would be to let the team down. We were always told how lucky we were to have been accepted into the unit. The moment my sword struck out Mori, I knew that I would survive the fight. They attacked me as they would an animal. They seemed to be counting on herding me into Takagawa and Ashida. Aomori didn't even try to get out of the way of my sword strike. I recall his eyes going wide. He looked surprised that I was using a weapon and not my claws. That's a fatal mistake. They thought they were fighting a beast. I would never have underestimated them as they did me. All the lessons I taught them about close combat thrown out the window as soon as their preconceptions entered the battlefield. Disgraceful. I killed Aomori. And as I did it, I realized I was not unworthy of the Red Samurai. They were unworthy of me. What did it mean that I, an infected monster that was less than a beast, could still defeat the finest soldiers in the world? Red Samurai Doctrine taught Aomori and the others not to fear me, and this overconfidence would be their death. I realized I'd progressed beyond their ability to understand. My sword was as accurate as ever, but they could not account for it due to ideological blindness. Huh. Yeah, did becoming a ghoul make you a better warrior? 
can you deny it? I could fight as well as when I was a man, but with eyes that had been opened to the hypocrisy of what Renraku had taught us. They taught us the lessons that made us useful tools. They do not want independent soldiers, but obedient ones. Sasaki was the next, next to fall. As I turned away from Aomori, I realized she must have seen me strike him. Her eyes were wide, and I could feel her fear and anger as she tried to summon another spell. She seemed caught between healing Aomori and attacking me. It was there, on Sasaki, a downward stroke from Jodan's stance. She had hesitated, just as Aomori had. I felt the breath go out of her, like someone had deflated a tire. She just slid down into a pile. I think she was trying to ask me how when I ran. Yeah, what about Yoshida and Takagawa? My goal was survival, not victory. Takagawa was too far away, and I did not see Ishida. I only smelled him, so I ran. The trains had been shut down due to the explosion, but as long as I could get out of Hakata Station, I knew I could escape. They did not follow me out into the city proper. From what I heard via the Matrix, the event was reported as a terrorist attack that was thwarted by brave Renraku soldiers. <laughs> brave, foolish soldiers. <sighs> it has been difficult to learn to fight while blind. <laughs> It's not the easiest thing I have attempted, but neither is it the hardest. Emptiness is form. It's one of the great lessons from the Hakagure. Ha Hakagure. Train sufficiently, and both swordsmanship and obedience will come instinctively. That is the closest to perfection a man can attain. Um. I don't put a whole lot of stock in being obedient. A lawless shadow runner have problems with authority. My goodness. I never would have guessed such a thing to be the case. When I was new to the unit, I thought that to be a good samurai was the ultimate goal, that to serve justly with dedication was the greatest honor a warrior could have. We were all young and foolish once, I suppose. So I changed your mind. Beyond my disease. There was a fight in Fukuoka. My former team ambushed me. I just told you about that, you fool. We were taught we were superior to everyone, that since we were pure humans and Japanese, we would always win. I believe that most never questioned the validity of this claim, even when confronted with direct evidence to the contrary. If you killed two of them, why are they still hunting you? I am unsure why that would make a difference. Can you explain what you are driving at? Huh. You stand three members might give up on you. Ah, I see. I think your mistake is in seeing this from a practical perspective. The problem is emotional, not mechanical. The nature of Red Samurai assignments is such that losses are generally zero, or the entire team. In those rare cases when Red Samurai teams suffer partial losses, the remnants of the impacted teams are shuffled together and undergo retraining. Sasaki and Aomori will undoubtedly be replaced. The problem is that I cannot be replaced. Simply put, I am not dead. Ordinarily, a missing Red Samurai would be considered dead for the purposes of reorganizing teams, but Renraku knows precisely what has happened to me. What's more, my failure to do my duty re reflects badly on the unit. Others will undoubtedly resist joining my former squad, as it has been tainted. So until they kill you, nobody wants to join them. Sure, 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 sure. Yes, this is the case. They cannot move forward and rebuild the core of the unit unless I die, both because of their own expectations and the stain on their honor. Even if they accepted my decision, the rest of the Rad Samurai would not. They have hunted me in Japan, Shanghai, and Beijing, and now I'm certain they hunt me here in Hong Kong. The cycle will continue endlessly for the foreseeable future. Such is the way of things. Um, eh, you sound just trapped as there. What do you mean by that? They have been hunting me. I am simply trying to make a new life for myself. I fail to see how this is my doing. Yeah, take the fight to them. You gotta take action, my dude. 
What do you believe I've been doing? Certainly I've not been allowing them to attack me out of goodwill. Hmm. And yeah, maybe you're unable to finish them off. Ah, yes, because I'm such a weak-willed soldier of fortune, I cannot bear the idea of killing the last vestiges of my old life. Certainly that is more likely than the battle simply not going in my favor. Yeah, it doesn't have to be like a conscious decision. There, there may be some truth to what you say. I had not considered that my instinct to flee may be subconscious. I seek to perfect myself, my skills and my abilities in combat. Perhaps this is not the path I would have walked when I was younger, but I have been a soldier for so long I cannot imagine devoting myself to any other trade. This does not mean I am tied inextricably to my unit. It simply means I am shaped by my history, as we all are. I appreciate your concern about my history and my unit, but I assure you I am doing all right. I must learn to adapt to my new condition and lifestyle on my own. The time will come when they find me in Hong Kong. That's what you do when they do. I am unsure. You've given me a great deal to consider, and I do not mean that lightly. There are several actions and possible outcomes I foresee. I could, as I have before, relocate to another city, flee Hong Kong, travel to somewhere further afield. Lagos, perhaps, or Montreal. It would have to be somewhere where Renraku's influence would be minimal, and where the unit's presence would be immediately noticeable. I could also keep a low profile, staying here, hope they are unable to find precisely where I am hiding. Undoubtedly, Ashida would command the team to keep looking. I believe it would only be a matter of time before they found me, but if they were, if it were a sufficiently long time, they might be recalled. I could also confront them, draw them out into the open at a time and place of my choosing. They are nothing if not predictable in their efforts to follow Red Samurai operational doctrine. That plan could succeed, but it could also put you and civilians at risk, and I am unsure how I would draw them out in the first place. Hmm. Yeah, you find a way to fight them. Hmm. I am unsure if that is the wisest course of action. I'm going to need to think about this a great deal. Please let me think on this. I'll have an answer later. Okay, I might be able to actually... It might be later right now, but let's save, and I need to go get some lunch. Peace out. And have a good uh, Saturday.